Okay, it is six o'clock, and I will you. note that so we no, are being recorded. So I would like to call the Concord Carlisle Regional School Committee to order. Call the Concord School Committee to order. Great. Okay, so up first we have our oh, just for Erin for the notes, all school committee members are present. No, I'm sorry. Um, Alexa Anderson is not present. She is traveling right now. The rest of the school committee is present in person. Aisha Lawton is in person. And if you can just watch the Zoom, Domingos is going to be joining us via Zoom. So we will start with our students. Welcome. Hello. Um, unfortunately, Zaria can't be with us tonight. She had a basketball practice that ran a little bit late. Um, but Felicity and I still have a presentation for you guys. Just give me one minute to get the screen share up. Oh, okay, sorry, one second. <laughs> no We've had a lot of technical issues ourselves. <laughs> sorry about that. I'm not doing this for my normal computer. Uh, oh, wait, I think we should be good. Hold on. There we go. Okay, perfect. You guys see it now? Yes. Okay, so a um, bit of a quicker update. But the first thing we would just say students are a little bit concerned about a lack of transparency around next year's new bell schedule. Um, there's definitely been some talk of it throughout the school. People have been mentioning it. And as like scheduling is coming around for next year, I think people are sort of wondering if a new bell schedule might impact the choices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and also, we did also just have like the end of uh, midterm week, which for some students, I think it was a little bit challenging, but mm -hmm. I think it's been nice because the weekend after was homework free. So we have been able to get a little bit of recovery from that. And now we're back. So yeah, for sure. Um, and as far as student senate goes, we're continuing to prepare for a bunch of our upcoming events in the spring. So that's exciting. We're trying some new stuff as well, which I think will be fun. Yeah, we're doing some like Valentine's Day stuff as well as some like an art night. And of course, the blood drive and other ideas that we're still discussing. Um, and oh, oh I can do the next one. Yeah. Okay. And then also additions for WIQH, which if you don't know the school's radio station, IQH Fest are starting soon. Um, it's the first one of these since before COVID. And it's really exciting. There's a picture of it to the right. They get like hundreds of kids to come and it's performances by music groups and different bands that kids at the school have formed. So I personally haven't had one in my time at school and Fliss has neither, but it should be a lot of yeah. fun. Mm -hmm. I'm also looking forward to it. I know a lot of people who are planning on performing, so yeah. that's going to be really fun. And yeah, other than that, basically just now quarter three is off to a good start. So that's really all we had for today. But yeah, so we have to run a little bit early. We have a Senate meeting after this, but well, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Harry, can I give you both a quick update about the schedule? We feel the same way. We're closing in on a communication plan as we put the final tweaks to what we think the schedule will look like. So you should hear information shortly. Okay. The whole community should, parents, everyone. Yeah, we'll be sure to pass that on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, great. And IQH Fest, I actually have been to a few of those and they are really awesome. I, is it in the CAF still? I think it's the stage yeah. 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 So that'll be fun. Glad to see things coming back like that. Yeah. yeah. Good. Thank you so much for your update. Anyone have any questions for students, comments? No. Nope. Quarter three is off to a good start. Yeah. Yes. Well. First day. I love a fresh start of second semester. We, we wish you all well. Yeah. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Of course. All right. And now we will move into public comment. So our public comment period will be a period of 20 minutes. It doesn't look like we have a lot of people in the room today. Um, so as a reminder, this is a meeting in the public and not with the public. So the school committee will not be responding to any comments. If you're in the room and you would like to speak, you can submit a blue form to me and you'll be called to speak. If you're on Zoom, you can use the raise hand feature. When called to speak, please state your name and address before you speak. We will go every other, starting with a comment in the room and then taking a comment on Zoom. And you will have a limit of three minutes. So do we have any public comment in the room? Okay, I don't see any comment in the room. So we'll go online. Uh, Kristen Haggerty. Hi, this is Kristen Haggerty, 95 Revolutionary Road in Concord. Um, I know that, or it looked like you were talking about policies that you've already been through the school policies today. And I think you're just finalizing them. And I wondered if the board could, uh, the committee could address 
what their plans are to implement and does it develop a new policy or augment the one they have related to incident reporting specifically to uh, microaggressions and other types of uh, racial incidents. So if uh, hopefully that comes up for discussion when you talk about the policies. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Erin Fife. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Erin Fife, 174 Hill Street in Concord. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for the DEI presentation um, from the um, audit consultants last um, last week. I thought it was uh, incredibly informative. I really appreciated the information that they shared. Um, and I am curious as to what the next steps are after that audit, um, if there'll be another presentation uh, after the, the school committee and the district has had time to sort of process some of those results, whether we'll have a follow up on that. And then the second question is, um, I saw that the coffees that were scheduled in the fall, I think um, I attended one of them and really appreciated that. And I was hoping to see a schedule for the spring if those will continue. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay. Any other public comment? Of them are online. All right, I will close up public comment. And now we are on to our budget workshop. So I just wrote a little something here about Tracy Novick who's joining us. This is really for the public. So Tracy Novick from MASC will be joining us. She is a field rep for the Massachusetts Association of School Committees and also a Worcester School Committee member. In addition, she holds a certification in school finance and she runs many of the MASC school finance workshops. She's presented on transparency and school budget presentation, school finance, chapter 70 implications of development, social media, superintendent evaluation, the list really goes on and on, the school committee's role in financial oversight. Um, so we're really excited to have her with us. And just as an aside, Alexa and I were able to go to her workshop at the conference. I don't know if anybody else hit that one. You hit that one with um, Brian. So Brian was your co-presenter, and it was just great to see the two of you present together. So without further ado, I will leave it to you, and we're really excited to have you with us here tonight. Great. Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, the one thing that my bio doesn't include, but I will share with all of you, is that um, while I, I certainly did not grow up here, I actually do have Concord as my birthplace. I'm an Emerson Hospital baby. So, <laughs> uh, uh, I won't say it feels like coming home, but it always feels like a, you know, a little bit sort of a checkbox and so sort of coming back. So I'm glad to be here with you all. Um, I did have a chance to have some conversations with your administrators about some of the work that you already have been doing. Um, I know that you already had gotten a presentation that was a little bit more sort of into the numbers and into the sort of the pieces of where your revenue comes from and so forth. Um, which is always good, um, among other things, it, it saves me having needing to do that, um, but also that is the kind of information that I would hope that you're getting from your business office and, um, you know, that that um, ongoing um, update in terms of, of information, how that works year to year. Um, this course is a particularly interesting year since the state information won't come out until March, um, but you're being able to um, know and get that and trust that I think is really important. So we can do the next slide. Really, um, what I've done in terms of the slides is just give you, and I think you want to click it so it shows up, um, is uh, in every case, what I've, what, what's on the slide is just to give sort of a form to the conversation, to give a frame to the conversation. Um, and I do want to encourage you that as I'm speaking, as you have questions, as you're looking for sort of more concretely how it might apply, um, that you stop me at any point, that you ask a question at any point, just so that um, so that as we go, we actually are answering those questions. Um, and so the first one is is really probably the one you all know, right? Which is um, 7137A is really kind of the, the elevator speech of what school committees do or the, um, the one where you boil it down. So th this is just the section of 37A, which is about budgets. Um, if you've been through any of the training of the course or any of the other training that MASC does, um, you probably know that the big four are goals, policy, budget, and hiring and evaluating the superintendent. Budgets obviously are one of the core functions of the school committee. Um, and one of the things that I always like to emphasize um, when I talk about this being one of the core responsibilities is that 
you know, we just mentioned that you're a public body. Um, you are doing the business of a public entity with public dollars, um, and you're doing that in pursuit of a public good. And so really the, the transparency of education spending for a local district comes to the school committee. Um, well, certainly the administration is subject to public records requests and the like, um, the actual, where does the money go? Where is the money coming from? How does it get where it needs to go? All of those kinds of conversations, the conversations over the course of the year, um, those all run through you. And in, in doing so, really, this is the place where the public gets to see what's going on with that, those funds. Um, and so, you know, we talk about school committees being the, le the legislature for school for um, school districts. Um, and in terms of the functioning of the budgetary allocation, that really is part of what you're doing there, which is legislatures do budgeting, legislatures do lawmaking, you do policy making, you do budget making as two, as two of your core functions. I also want to mention, um, we're going to talk about budget tonight, but I always think it's crucial for school committees to understand that um, none of your core responsibilities exist in a vacuum, um, that they're all interrelated to each other. And so when you establish goals, those goals are what you're going to evaluate the superintendent on. But that's also the, what your budget should be directed towards fulfilling. Um, when you establish policies, um, among other things, that's what the administration is actually going to function under. Um, but in particular, when we talk about fiscal policies, that's actually how your budget's going to be carried out over the course of the year. Um, so none of those um, four responsibilities is something that exists all by itself. Um, and in fact, they are significantly weaker if they do exist by themselves. And your budget really should never exist in isolation. It really should be linked. Um, it is a policy document that should be linked particularly to your goals. So come to the next slide. Can Aaron hear Next us? slide, Aaron. Aaron, next slide. I see she's moving the camera. <laughs> there we go. Here. So you probably are familiar with 7141 um, because we usually bring it up most often um, for superintendents. This is the, the section of the master law that covers how long a superintendent's contract could be. Less well known is the same um, section of the Massachusetts general law actually covers your school business administrator. Um, and um, it's interesting to me because this is a different section than, um, say, assistant superintendents are covered by. That's a completely different section. Some of you might be familiar with it. It has a section about sort of advice and consent. And this is actually much more straightforward language. Um, and while your school business administrator works for the superintendent, is evaluated by the superintendent, um, that relationship is, is parallel in many ways to the other administrators within the district. Um, there is a sort of separate relationship in terms of the contractual language um, with the school business administrator. And I always bring this up because um, in a strong working relationship between the school committee and the school business administrator and the superintendent, um, there should be a working relationship between the school business administrator and, this, and the school committee. Um, this should be an individual that you trust. It should be someone that you feel um, is um, is able to answer your questions, um, is um, someone that you actually have a good feedback for the superintendent with. Um, that's actually something that is, I think, of particular importance when it comes to the budget because of the responsibility you have around the budget. Um, so I bring that up here just to, to sort of flag that as an important thing. Now, the other reason that I flag it is um, because school committees can, not all do, but school committees can, um, get very, very excited about their, um, their function as the um, budgetary oversight and um, sometimes can, I don't know if forget's really the right word, but can, can sort of get out over their skis in terms of um, what part is their job and what part is the actual school business official's job. Um, and so one of the, I remember very vividly, probably four or five times with four or five different people over even the last six months, saying to a school committee member, but you have someone for that. There's someone whose full-time job is actually to do that. Um, and that's always the balance I find for school committees. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about at what level you pass the budget, at what level um, you look at quarterly reports, um, at what level effectively you're having your ongoing conversation over the course of the year of what's going on with the budget. But I do think it's important for school committee members um, to remember that 
you're much like when we talk about um, things like goal setting, you're at the 50,000 foot level. You're, you're at a much higher level in terms of your administration of the budget, your oversight of the budget, than the day-to-day -day allocations of the budget, than the day-to-day -day spending of the budget. Um, and I will say that that can be a real struggle for people because they're, for, for all of the reasons that people run for school committee, which are as many as there are school committee members, I'd say, um, there are certainly people who run on kind of a budget thing. They're going to figure out where the money goes. You're going to straighten out where the money goes. You're going to change where the money goes. Um, and of course, much like anything else, the first thing you learn is that doing any of that takes more than just your vote. Um, but also, it's important to remember that um, only so much of that is actually your job, that some of that actually belongs to the school business administrator in terms of the day-to-day -day work. And again, that can be um, that can be a difficult thing for some people to sort out. But again, keeping yourself back up to the level at which, um, which we'll talk about more in a second, um, school committee's function is important. Yeah. I have two questions. Sure. Uh, one is that you say that the six years for the uh, superintendent and business administrator, mm -hmm. something that we came up with a question last year in Carlisle was, what about teacher contracts? Is that is that the three year max? So, yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, and then, can you give some examples of when, like, you know, we hear about people overstepping, but yeah. like, what are some concrete? I mean, is it like people like questioning like how many rolls of toilet paper? People yes. Buy? Like, <laughs> what kind of so, so this one, and this is one that we will talk a little bit about warrants later on, um, but I think warrants tend to lend themselves to people like wanting to go co count copier paper boxes or that kind of thing. So certainly I run into that. And then you have to remember that we'll talk more about that when we get there. But when it comes to warrants, you're but one step in a whole bunch of steps that get there. So that's actually, I, I had that tussle even within the last sort of two or three weeks with the school committee where someone was saying, but if I'm signing off on it, I should be able to go confirm. And I was like, yes, but that's actually somebody else's job. Somebody else's job is to do the confirmation. You're the job to say, yes, all of these steps have occurred and now we're releasing the funds. Um, not saying that's easy, but I am saying that some of this action functions on um, mutual trust and professionalism. Um, so without trying to, without telling stories out of school, um, <laughs> I have run into a new school committee member who wanted every expenditure that had happened in the school district for the past five years. And, and, and the problem, of course, is that, yes, it's a public record, but there, there are things that you can do, and then there's the question of sort of why are you doing them? And if you're the public official who functions as a member of the school committee, um, you can ask that question, and legally they would be obligated to give it to you. But my question is always, you're a member of a governance body, and you should be pursuing the goals of the district and working together with your colleagues. Um, and so it's hard to argue that that's probably necessary, particularly since, as I would say, you have people for that. Like you have not only have people who actually do that, you also have auditors who come in and actually do the legal oversight of that too. Um, so that's been one I've heard. Um, you know, there certainly are lots of, um, we'll talk, a, in a, actually, why don't we, yeah, why don't we switch the next slide? So this, cause this kind of goes along with that. You might need to, there we go. Um, so the, the, this is sort of the, the balance one alongside the next one, right? So 7134 is one that comes up a lot in this next section of the year um, that we're leading into, which is, you know, school committees pass their budgets and then they go to town meeting and somebody stands up and wants to like reallocate funds from the teacher account or whatever. Um, and they legally cannot do that. I just feel like that's a really important thing for school committees to know. You have the internal allocation of your budget they have the sort of bottom line of what they're um, of what's going to you. So that's an important thing to know. The expenditures within the total appropriation, though, are done at um, what we refer to as the cost under level, right? So you're going to get a report later this evening um, in terms of effectively it reports out in the chart of accounts, right? The thousand levels, the hundred levels. Um, my understanding is that you pass that the thousand levels is very common. That tends to be about where people are at. Um, what those cost centers exactly are does vary. Not everybody does it exactly according to Desi's chart of accounts, um, but something of that nature. There certainly, though, are school committee members who then say, okay, but I want to talk about why we have X number of teachers over here and Y number of teachers over here. I'm not saying that's not a valid question, 
but in terms of whether or not you can actually allocate the funds in a different way, um, that usually is outside of school committee purview. Any other sorts of questions around that kind of notion? Because it's it's it, it's tied into pretty intimately a lot of the kind of the work that you do. Okay, so why don't we look at the next slide? Because this this is actually the um, this is both the quarterly reports and really the um, the place in in the Department of Revenue's um, language that kind of creates or um, or reconfirms, I guess you would say, the authority. So um, Department of Revenue opinions, the first two, two numbers are actually the year in which it was issued. Um, so those of you who have been around public education, 1993 may ring a bell as being an important year, right? Mm -hmm. And part of what happened, um, we, we always think about 1993 in terms of things like MPAS and state standards, but part of what happened is that there was a real reconsideration of lines of authority between the superintendent and the school committee. And because of that, there was this sort of flurry of questions that went out as to how much authority did the school committee still have around things, and was any of that authority something that could be delegated? Um, and so this is one of the, the decisions that um, we tend to come back to a lot, which is that um, transfer authority, cost center authority, continues to belong to the school committee. So there are other things that that went that shifted to become part of the administration of the superintendents. This remains with the school committee. And so what that means, and you know this because you have a good model here, is that you pass your budget at a cost center level, right? So that's sort of big buckets of money. If there is a time, and usually there is, um, when the administration needs to move money from one of those buckets to a different bucket, they have to come back to the school committee and talk about what's going on and ask you to vote to move the money. Okay, now this is as a best practice, which I know that you're actually um, doing here, also a good chance for there to be a school committee conversation about, okay, we passed the budget, this was the plan, this is what we thought was going to happen, this is what we've been doing, um, how's that working out? Is, are things shaking out the way they thought they were going to? Um, certainly in many districts, because a lot of budgets get passed before the state budget does, that's usually the first quarter question is, okay, so how'd the revenue work out? Like, did we get what we thought we were going to or did something else happen? Um, but then as the year goes along, of course, there are other changes that happen, right? There are gas and oil prices that might go up, for example, school districts having that conversation. Um, in other years, so far, um, there are snow removal costs that suddenly go through the roof. Um, there can be years in which the substitute teaching cost has to go through the roof, or you have to shift money because you have a sudden number of teachers that all go out on maternity leave, or something else happens. Um, so we, we deal with, first of all, human beings, and second of all, things like weather and buildings, all of which have changing needs over the course of the year. Um, those are really good things for the school committee to know anyway, but also you have a fiduciary authority and a responsibility to be informed and then to make what changes are necessary to make sure that your needs are actually covered over the course of the year because you do have to run a balanced budget. Um, so that's really what goes on with the transfer authority staying with the school committee. And I will note again, because what that means is that because you are a public body, money conversations cannot take place in the executive session. You are naturally then having the conversation in public over, huh, you know, we seem to be spending a lot more on gas this year. Or gosh, you know, we had to go in and repair the roof for this building. That may mean that long term we have to do something now. And of course, what all of this is leading to is, first of all, next year's budget, right? So if you get to the third quarter and it looks like gas prices still haven't come down, well, when the new budget comes, is recommending a higher amount for utilities. It's not really going to surprise anyone, right? That's you've all kind of been on that page already. Um, Honestly, one of the things that I think is most important about the quarterly budget transfers and the quarterly budget reporting um, isn't just, I mean, that it's legally required, but also that it leads you so nicely into your next budget conversation. Because if everybody's been sort of paying attention to those along the way, there's really only going to be so many surprises by the time you get to the fourth quarter. Um, and again, you've got, you're in good hands here in terms of your reporting out, um, familiar with, um, with Bob's work from elsewhere. So, you know, you're actually going to, you're going to get reports that actually give you the information that you need in there, um, which let me just say is not, is not true everywhere else. 
Yes. Question about timing. Yes. Um, I don't think this school committee expects to pre-approve some of these transfers where needs come up and have to be addressed. Some of this is post facto, but can you speak to the timing and when there would be a change that would be of such a magnitude that it would be advisable for Bob and Lori to bring this to us for effectively pre-approval instead of post-approval? So really, if there's money that's moving from one cost center to another to cover a cost, it should go to you before that happens. But that's part of why the cost centers are as big as they are, because that does that means that not every little change is necessarily going to come back here. And that's one of the things that I that I talk to school committees about when they say, well, I don't really like the level at which we pass our budget. One of the things I remind them is that you don't you don't want the, the, the administration to have to come back to you every single time that something not very big changes. Um, but if you are, um, for example, seeing, I mean, right, so here's here is my extreme example. Um, about seven years ago or so, I probably have the year on. Um, Worcester was the city in the entire United States, not just the continental United States, but the entire United States that got the most snow. Um, and I know this because I was at the National School Boards Convention in Washington, D.C. that January, and I was on a bus, and there was a, somebody else there with a tag around their, their neck, and he asked where I was from, and I said Worcester, and he said, oh, I'm familiar with Worcester. You got all of our snow. And he was from <laughs> Anchorage, Alaska. <laughs> um, so we we spent the account the facilities account um, significantly down before we started transferring money into it um, because there were other things in the facilities account besides snow removal right but part of what was in that account were was money that we were planning on spending in say April and May and June the administration was maybe borrowing against that until they needed to transfer money from other accounts so. The, the transfer should happen before the spending happens, but that doesn't mean that all of your little line items that necessarily fell under that thousand account have all been the way that, that you passed them back before. So that's the magnitude question. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yep, uh, that's exactly the magnitude question. As long as they can stay within a thousand, Yes. we can play catch up. Exactly. Okay. And I mean, and again, there, uh, there are lots of districts that are very comfortable with the desk charter accounts of that. There certainly are districts that kind of play with it a little bit and say, you know, maybe we need to divide out the teaching account into elementary, and this is really a case here, but elementary and secondary, or we need to, those, those kinds of conversations do sometimes happen. Yep. How are cost centers established? I mean, because I'm on two school committees, yep. and in Carlisle, um, anytime there's a transfer at the thousand level, mm -hmm. that's our cost center. Yep. Right? But, but I, we were never part of a conference, you know, it's just kind of the first day that you see your first variance report yep. comes a report and say, oh, by the way, we're going to need to yes. you know, move this there. Um, whereas, like here, we've never we've never voted on any. I'd say point. end of year is the time we bring you. We tend to be able to stay within the cost centers, thankfully. End of year, we might bring you things if we have a surplus that's going to be expensive. Okay, but like, but, but how do school committees establish, establish them? them too? Yeah. Like, I mean, so, is it something that you reaffirm regularly, or is it just something that becomes? I mean, so I thought that was actually what you're because I mean that's the same. The answer is this is the same in terms of sort of when, right? So uh, before. When you are um, going through a year before you start the next budget, although that's sort of because budgets are cycles, that's kind of an arbitrary, but not lying. But um, I would say that this most often comes up when school committees um, are facing some sort of reason why they think that this isn't working. So it tends to be the kind of thing, I mean, budgeting is sort of small C conservative, right? We don't change things unnecessarily if they're working. Um, but I mean, I can think of a school district, for example, that I've recently had this conversation with where they had a circumstance where they got to the end of the year and they were a couple million dollars in arrears because of the stuff that had happened. Okay, so they fixed the stuff that fixed, but part of what the school committee said is, you know, we were only seeing things in like four or five cost centers. We think that we need a greater degree of detail over the course of the year so that we have a better, um, I mean, first of all, so we and the public feel much more secure as to where we're at with this, um, but also so, so that we're doing a better job of oversight. 
So it's the kind of thing you could put into, like we have a working manual, mm -hmm. right? Like, there maybe could be a little budget section in the working manual that's like, you know, like our call center is the thousand level, yeah. right? And like just yeah. to give yeah. the new yeah. members because it's this. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I do think it's it's great that you're here tonight because we're exactly doing this after you leave. And Bob <laughs> just sent us a memo of, you know, we have our quarter two and you yeah. can see where everything is at. And it is definitely not just the thousand level that he's reporting out. So I think it's like this is all kind of like real live where doing it at the same time for the benefit of members that have been here before and new members that haven't been through this process. So, and I mean, you heard the president, we heard when I did the similar yeah. presentation with, with the CFO, Deputy Superintendent Brian Allen for Worcester and his truism always is. And by the second quarter, that's when you know what the trends are, right? First quarter yeah, doesn't tell right, you too much. Right, yeah. Second quarter is when you're like, okay, so what kind of years is going to be? What? Go ahead. Yeah, first quarter is a month. Right, so, first yeah. quarter is like, Okay. Yeah. I mean, the teachers barely got back in the yeah. classrooms that, you know, that's why I always have to warn my new members. So I'm the chair of finance operations of Worcester. Like, you guys don't get too excited about all the money that we left the teachers <laughs> account because they barely got paid at all. Like, <laughs> we still have to, we still have the rest of the year to do. Um, same thing with the utilities, the gap, you know, it's not on yet. So, um, yeah, that, so the second quarter is really, I mean, this is, this is the one where you really start to dig in, right? Yeah. So, that's a good good time. I, think I love that you and and like every it seems that everyone who works for MASC also serves on their school committee. I know. Um, like I, I love it. All either do or have, yeah. and most most of the rest of the staff like yeah. shows such a passion. But I love it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what people. At, so I in, in Worcester, people will say, "So you're on the school committee? What do you do for a living?" <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best practice for a lot that there's quarterly reports. It's the best practice. With both on we so the the transfers are a department of revenue decision based on the fiduciary responsibility of the school committee under chapter 71. But in terms of the things move between cost in, in terms of where things move between cost Okay. Yes. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Please. Can I add that? So just to please provide do. some perspective to it. Um, so um just from a legal perspective, my understanding is we're talking to our auditors that we do need that transfer when it happens, that would be best practice. Um, so in my last district, we actually voted on these quarterly mm -hmm. here, we present them and it's kind of understood that if there's an issue, we discuss it, but you're going to see tonight when you look at them that we've already post posted adjustments. Um, when we're audited, we will need to have like the school committee approving the adjustment. We'll need to show that to the auditors. That's mm -hmm. something they check on. Um, we could vote on these quarterly. I, I do think that um, for something significant, I'll give you the examples of things we're over on. So out of district tuitions, um, that would be an example of something that's going to happen that you're, we're going to have to cover or just legally obligated, obligated to cover. Um, and our transportation costs, you know, we're legally obligated to cover special ed. So there's going to be times when things happen. And I, from the business officer's best practice, practice standpoint, um, we want to find out how to cover those instead of leave them a, in a deficit um, as we move forward. So there is a little bit of balance. Um, I, I would offer that it might be best practice to approve these in arrears on a quarterly basis, but you're also getting advice from Tracy to consider. Um, so it's just, it's there is some nuance to it and it's a challenge mm -hmm. um, between what's best practice, what's required and um, I mean, I think that's what was driving my magnitude question. Sure. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I, from, I got that from Cynthia's question. But, yeah. but it also shows our leadership and that's as, as our job. It <laughs> right? is. And I don't think it would be a tool to say push back on something that's obviously yeah. something that would, it's, it's not, it, it's again, not providing good leadership to, to not vote something to transfer that is a requirement for our students' education, mm -hmm. right? So. I mean, that's our job is to, with your recommendation, that you would tell us all these things. And it, this isn't more an optional kind of thing. You need to do this. Mm -hmm. So, um, and there's something not to be approved. Now it's contingent upon us to find a solution for the new problem that just got created. Yes. <laughs> that's a very good way of putting it. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also, I, I want to sort of um, flag a point that Bob implicitly made, which is that. The, on all of these kinds of things, um, I'll certainly flag it again when we get to warrants, um, making sure that the bills get paid in this works for the people who are doing the day-to-day, -day, you know, sort of budgeting in the business office part is also part of the school committee's job. Yeah. Um, that's part of what we emphasize in terms of having clear policies that they can then establish clear procedures under. 
Um, but also you know, not making life hard for your business office, I think is also part of the job of the school committee. Um, one of the things that I sort of jokingly say sometimes to school committees um, is that when you get you know, your budget requests in terms of personnel and, and that sort of thing, the one office you should always inquire about in terms of staffing um, is your business office because that is the office that is generally not gonna ask for more staffing when they need it. Um, you'll hear, for te hear that you need teachers, you might hear that you need custodians, you might hear that, but I, I always think of it as being sort of an additional responsibility in the school committee to make sure that the people who are actually doing the budgetary work are not just the ones who are sort of saying yes and no to everyone else in terms of what goes through, but also actually get to have their own needs met. Um, so that, yeah, so let's go on to the next one because the, in terms of sort of what else you do during the year, Grants and gifts is another one we've, we've had come up. Um, so there's actually two sections of, MG, of the MGL that deal with this. The regional schools kind of get there. There's a sort of section that deals with that too. Um, the, the actual overwhelming notion is the same regardless, which is that they do have to be voted by the school committee. School committee does have to vote acceptance. Um, and I've had almost every iteration of conversation possible. Um, MASC was, uh, was a little behind in terms of one of its sections of the policy, and I revamped DD, which will stay forever in my mind, um, <laughs> to make sure that it actually aligned with 7137A, um, and I've gotten all kinds of questions since then. Um, what changed? Did they move the law? No, no. We just, we just hadn't actually clarified our, um, our language to make sure it actually adhered to this. I do want to note, it does not actually make um, any exception in terms of dollar amount. Um, and the Department of Revenue has determined that this is also not an authority that you can delegate. So yes, you do have to accept grants. Yes, you do have to accept gifts. Yes, you do have to accept all of them. Yes, I understand that in some cases this is a pain in the neck. Um, but here's what I will say. I'm on the school committee of the second largest you know, district in Massachusetts and I regularly pass gifts that are $35 and so forth. So yes, uh, you know, when I say that, it, it is actually something that I mean. So um, there are places where I don't always, not always doing a great job of that, but that one actually does say, yes. Does that include like anything, like if somebody wants to contribute something to their kid's classroom, they, 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 they It is free. supposed to be, particularly, I mean, if it's consumable, there's a, there's perhaps a, a, a yeah. right? Like you sent in cupcakes for the kid's birthday. But, like like those, like those. Right. but generally, I mean, if it's a donation, the part of the reason is that you're accepting it and then it becomes the property of the school district by virtue of your accepting the gift um and probably less of, well i don't know i've stepped on my nose to my people <laughs> um you may well be also accepting a degree of responsibility yeah. for things like upkeep right this comes in with people get very excited about donating say playgrounds okay who's going to pay to fix it when it breaks the school district is do you accept that res that fiduciary responsibility um so that's usually it. The other reason, of course, for the school committee to be um, the one that accepts this is that there's an assumption that there's a little bit of vetting involved, whether from the administration or from the school committee or both. Um, and you may not want to take money from just anyone. You may not want to take a gift from just anyone. Are there strings attached to it? Um, that actually is part of the story with why grants are voted by the school committee, um, because grants I mean, one of my colleagues from the other state always refers to them as really grants are just a contract. You're you're agreeing to do particular things in order to have this money come to you. Um, do those particular things align with the goals that you've set in the school district? Because if they don't, maybe you shouldn't be taking the money. Um, less of an issue with your title grants, you know, and IDEA and so forth. Um, generally less of an issue with ESSER, um, but depending on where your grants come in, um, depending on what the allocation is, um, that may, that's something to consider. Now, again, ideally, administration is not applying for grants, isn't putting grants forward that are out of line with the goals of the school committee. But it is something to consider. It's really a place where you're another check on that. Any questions or conversation around does, that? Does it yeah. mean anything that individual gifts are mentioned here? Um, or is that just... Yeah, it, it doesn't really. Okay. Um, I need to add, I don't have the other language that close to the top of my head. Um, the listing exists in this section. My recollection is that the, the specification does not exist in the other one. In terms of, and then that always makes people think that this is everything. So as a practice then, uh, were I to write an individual check, that too would be subject to administration bringing it to school committee for approval. Yes. Thank you. 
And I will uh, also volunteer that the tricky one tends to be PTOs. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something to sort of have established with your PTOs in terms of, you know, what is their practice? What, under how do they make decisions? Um, what are they deciding to bring forward to school district? The school district and has that align with the goals of the school, the goals of the district, all that. Yeah, and Carl Outley vote on the PTO grants to vote to, vote to accept them. Mm -hmm. I just ask in terms of um, like parent donations to a PTO, PTG, PA, anything like that. They are their own established 501 cs so they kind of exist separately yes. from us, and they run their accounts separately. So we wouldn't need to accept those. So you don't accept those. It's only no. once they, as a P, as an organization, then are doing something for the school or for the. So district. if they were going to write the district a grant, like Q5 was a grant that the PA funded, that would get accepted mm -hmm. by the school committee. Yep. Mm -hmm. Or they bought you a playground, yeah. or they Which refurnished the yeah. yeah. library, whatever. Yeah. Yep. Brought us equipment for. Exactly. Program. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yes. And obviously, this naturally leads nicely into you're also knowing, you know, things like, you know, being able to thank the appropriate people. Um, but also, it can be useful in terms of you being able to balance out, okay, well, this PTO seems to be doing a lot, that one isn't, mm -hmm. or how come we keep only getting grants for this and we haven't put this into the general fund? There's There are fiduciary reasons for you to actually have this authority as well. Yeah. All right, let's do the next one, which is everybody's favorite. Okay, so this is warrants, in case you ever wondered what the, the language for that looked like. Um, <laughs> the this approve and transmit to the town accountant. Okay, obviously the regional language, this is another one that has regional language, it's a little bit different, but um, the, the notion here, again, is that you are part of a larger system of checks and balances. Um, and again, in terms of things I've seen school committee members individually really struggle with, this maybe tends to be one, only because you know you you've got something in front of you that you have to sign to say that you've got something or something happened, and really what you potentially maybe have is additional pieces of paper that in some ways are giving you evidence of that, and that's it. Um, you you know didn't actually see the copier paper boxes come in, and you don't know that these people have actually been doing that. And again, this is where it's important to remember that you're at the end of a long line of a whole bunch of things that happen to get you there. Um, and while the school committee doesn't approve policy, um, if you are the warrant signer, ask the question. Ask, ask what the steps are that come before you. Um, because you know, one of the things I emphasize to school committee members is it is it is a legal action you are taking, right? Your signature means something. Um, and it's good to have some have some confidence in the steps of the process beforehand. Um, but the idea here, of course, is that there is no place in the school district or any other public body, you see this applies to towns and everyone else as well, where you can, as an individual, say, we're going to spend money on X and then become the person who actually disperses the funds. Because that's how you end up with your name and headlines and not in any kind of good way. Um, so this is intentionally effectively red tape. But we have red tape for reasons, um, and it's to, to make sure this happens. Now, in terms of warrant processes, there are lots of them. Um, a lot of districts have certainly moved to electronic signing um, when we had everybody at home in their own houses. Um, you don't have to use them. You can. It's been legal, legally binding since the Clinton administration. Um, one thing that I do recommend is that you, whatever the process is, um, that you feel that you have a, at least some understanding, if you're the warrant signer, of what it is you're signing. What are you signing for? Um, and the, the thing that I always emphasize is that it has to work for everyone. So it absolutely has to work for the business office, whatever it is you're doing. Um, but it also should be something where the school committee feels like they have some understanding of the process. Um, and also, again, that you always understand what it is that you're signing to sign for. Any questions on that? So okay. effectively, we're signing for all the steps that preceded our own. Yes, in a so sense, because you're not sense. looking at the box of copier paper. Exactly. Use your example. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yes. Okay. This is this is part of a much longer chat like section that talks about sort of you know author what you're authorizing, um, but this is the you know did the PO match the what you got kind of thing. Somebody else already did that part. Mm -hmm. And we should and I understand you shouldn't ask like why do you need so much paper necessarily, <laughs> but. If you have a case, for example, let's say Bob says, oh, look, we have, you know, it comes with a variance report, so we actually had to buy $100,000 of paper yeah. last month, right? And 
and you've already seen all of the warrants for that, but then you see another like warrant later yeah. on where there's yes, like 50,000 more paper. <laughs> paper. And you go, like, are you allowed to ask like, hey, Bob, what's up with that? It's like, that's an open thing. So if something, if something breaks from what you have been led to believe well, based on conversation. I mean, you know, that that school so committee is back as much as possible to the quarterly budget process. First of all, because that puts you back about the level that you should. Um, but there is a reason why you're signing the warrant too. So, so whatever the process is and whoever it is that's doing the signing, there should be some way in which they can say, can you just tell me what this is about? Um, the part where you say, I mean, so the example, I mean, there are the, there are the exciting extreme examples, but the less exciting extreme examples. Um, if you as a school district spent a lot of time talking about how you were going to expand the foreign language department and like this was like your budget this was your goal this was your what you were driving your budget on and then and there was a whole conversation about like what curriculum you were adopting and all this kind of thing and so you're going through the year and you're expecting that these are going to be expenditures you're going to see and instead suddenly boom you've got yourself a new math curriculum and you're signing a warrant for that and like this hasn't come up anywhere now you don't have a school committee necessarily always authorized curriculum so we made your change but it's okay for the school committee to say, so at what point are we actually getting the French and German and whatever curriculum that we had said we were getting, right? Um, that's really the place where there can be a warrant conversation that's also a goal conversation and a budget conversation. Is it also a legitimate question to ask, hey, what's going on with the math curriculum? Like, like yeah. will, we get, will, will we hear more about well, the curriculum? And, like, and does think that become a questioning of the, the practice? Well, no, I think that's the only one that goes back to the chair to say, you know, if you if you have been delegated the responsibility of signing the warrant, to raise with the chair, hey, so just, so I saw this come through. Can you check in and see if there's a time at which we're going to have this conversation? Because it may be that, you know, a month down the pike, you're going to have a whole conversation about how the math curriculum is changing and how the whatever is, yes. So that, I think, is a good one to sort of direct back through the, where is the school committee conversation on this going to happen? Okay. Yep. Um, and of course, the other thing is that if you see that, you know, Bob is buying a boat, yeah, you I have an authorized maritime <laughs> program, that's one where somebody needs to be having some serious conversations first with the superintendent and also with possibly with legal counsel, because okay? that's really what the warrant signing is about. Um, and, you know, Bob is not going to buy himself a boat. That doesn't mean that there haven't been examples in which warrant signing did catch things that were not supposed to be happening and legal counsel did get involved so you do have this kind of responsibility for a reason there too if you could google the 90s and 80s on fraud it, this was i don't know if this was why this rule was created but it was prevalent in um, the public sector and it's certainly tightened up in the last 15 to 20 years yes there was a movie about a case in New York. Yes. Yes, there was. was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh How goodness. often do you end up with a school finance movie that's a drama? But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, there are Massachusetts examples of, you know, warrants coming through that seem to be for having a lot of vocation, the vocational program do a lot of work on a space that it turned out was at the superintendent's house on the Cape. Um, that's one of the examples that end up in the paper. Funny, not funny. Um, I just had a question about single uh, designee versus majority. Yeah. Do you, because we've talked, to, we've talked about this since Bob started, you know, like, do we move towards single designee or not? Or so we're just trying to, you know, feel our way around that. Do you feel like some school committees have a best practice of single? Like, how do you feel about it? I'll just ask. Um, I can understand why there might be regionals not moving towards that. Mm -hmm. And it's not usually for internal reasons, it's for external reasons. So you would be a better judge than I as to whether or not that's the kind of thing which holds you in good stead, say with the town of Pumps. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly know regionals, I mean, I had this conversation with this show about, about two weeks ago, like, they, and they all started nodding around the table and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> do not make you know if, if you can if, if that somehow gets you in good stead with the fincom you know figure it out and see if you can do that um otherwise it's really just a question of um people feeling comfortable yeah. with delegating that authority and having a process that actually works to get the bills paid mm -hmm. as long as those two things are true i don't know that it really matters okay is, yeah is, is there not a fail safe however in that any one member signer or not could say stop the warrant i want to learn more um, so if you are, Not if you are, if that. you all sign the warrant, yes, it, that should be a 
should be part of your process, however you sign the warrants. There should be a place at which that happens. Or is, is possible. Let me, let me ask you again. I've been told that signer or not a signer, any member could say, hold the warrant, I don't understand something, and, and pose a question. Um, you is can. that true or isn't it? So uh, what the, the assumption was it was somewhere in the guidelines. So what 4161 says is that the author, if the authority is delegated to a single signatory, it does not um, take away the responsibility of every member of the committee, whether or not you sign. So I guess that's the language that led yes. to my... Which then sort of I, gives I to the, okay. if you have that responsibility, yeah. then you would implicitly then have the right to ask. Which I think gives any school committee comfort that if they do delegate it to a very few people, they still uh, have uh, the public knowing there's more eyes on it. And generally speaking, if there's a single signatory, the warrant usually still goes, I mean, at least electronically, the warrants usually will go to the Which warrant committee. Which is our practice, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, yeah so. and I will say our practice is working. We yeah. all get the yeah. warrant electronically. We have a majority at the region sign and a majority at CPS sign, and, and it's all going swimmingly. So, okay. And I should also begging, say that. And nobody's <laughs> begging for the call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and working on your side. Yeah, too, I, I actually sure. asked our accounts payable, our uh, accountant um, a couple of weeks ago, and she said, yes, she receives response responses from the school committee promptly. Oh, good. Um, so, uh, and because we have four out of seven for the yeah. region, we need all four to sign because you need a majority to approve the warrant. Yeah. And we have three for CPS. So the three from CPS and the four from the region are, she said, very timely. Right. And I don't want to digress too much, but it, yeah. must, it must be better because in the past, I would sometimes get an email saying, would somebody <laughs> sign it? <laughs> <laughs> Takes its way up and, yeah. and they come into me and they're like, can you get can and, you just get the signature? And that's not happening now. No, it's not. It's not. Thank you. And the understanding she has is because technically I think you can only designate like well, you can have one designee the way we do it is we're basically having the school committee approved, but it's majority of the school committee. Um, if somebody is away or sick and can't do it, we can ask somebody else to approve. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, we have a sale safe. Yeah, good. Yes, um, this is really this conversation in particular has been very helpful to me. I'm a relatively new member and a warrant signer, so um, thank you. I I think my biggest like aha uh -huh experience in this this topic was that like that there is a big process that leads to this point. I didn't know that, so I would is that is now a good moment to understand that process, or is there? I, I would. I mean, I've done this for other districts too, where um, exactly what. Tracy said happens is somebody comes in the first time they're looking at it, there's a million questions. Yeah. And I just have them come in and I'd explain the warrant process. And so they would, and then they go use a few of the bills as examples and ask a few questions. Yeah, I'd love that. Um, so, yeah, well, the other yeah. thing is Sarah and I are on this new member onboarding committee, and that would be like something great to add into yeah. the annual, like kind of like this is right. the process on warrant yeah. signing. You know, just so when you are asked to be a warrant signer, because I think everyone in this room was probably asked to be a warrant signer as soon as they got onto a school committee. <laughs> so you had no, like I had no idea. Yeah, I came on, I, right? I I just, asked, right? Yeah, so yeah. I think like just even having like a cheat sheet of like here are all the steps that it goes through. Yeah. Before it gets to you. Yeah, I can. That would be great. Like an understanding of I feel like I've gotten into the rhythm of. I understand the patterns, yeah. so like it, I sort it's gotten sure. faster, yeah. and I appreciate that. Actually, it's been a good experience. Mm -hmm. In some weird way, but but um, but yeah, it's it would be very helpful. That would be great if you don't mm -hmm. draft something. Yeah, and it is like a lot of other things, right? Where you you will start to recognize. If I mean, there's certainly a lot to true about school committees. It's like the first year, you're just sort of figuring things out, right? Yeah, so this is another one where you yeah. kind of get the the hang of what the cycle is and yeah. when are the payrolls coming in and whether that yeah, that sort of thing is useful too. So when I joined in Carlisle, I got chosen as signer. <laughs> and I remember, I mean, that this was all pre-pandemic and all that. And so I have to come in and she right. gave me binders yep. of um of the of yeah. the like this is the contract and this is the this and this is like I, like all of this stuff to look at up like and then everything. Yeah. It was just if you want to see any bills, if you want to see any substantiation behind, you can get it, and it all went to electronic. But I assume that there is like something like yes, we. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, this is so processes. much bigger than Carlisle, right? So I don't imagine you have like oh, this is. It's Mark. more automated here. All, all the documents <laughs> are scanned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, in my last district, it was paper based too. I would get a, yeah. a warrant, a cover sheet that you see, and then I have all the invoices attached. And um, yeah. 
here we scan them right into um, into the into the warrant. So um, Ian or I can go in and look and it's see the like backup. Five, yeah. five years, not when I first got here. People would sit here at the table and sign, yeah. half paying attention to the meeting. Well, right, and that that's yeah. the one that always breaks my heart is sort of like when you walk into a school committee meeting and like the binders going around yeah. and I'm always like, oh, did anyone see it? And like then to your point, yeah. right? You're not paying attention to the warrant and you're not paying attention to the meeting. Yeah, yeah so all our backups generally in this accounting software, and that's how it makes its way through the approvals too, because it, it gets yeah. approved right all up through us on the last one. Much to people's chagrin sometimes, but so I get declined. I'm sure we're back, <laughs> back, to the, back to the start. Yeah. And we do generally load the contracts right onto the PO. So if we see yeah. an invoice is playing at PO, we can look at the PO and then it'll be a contract that's scanned right there. Um, maybe not something for a paper order, but like for anything significant. Mm -hmm. And then can we do the, the last slide here? Just I put together just sort of this image, which was designed. To there we go. Um, try to kind of encompass what it looks like in the course of a year. Mm -hmm. I don't think this has necessarily everything on it, right? Um, but to give you the idea, first of all, that it's a cycle and it's a circle, um, and your business office is frequently dealing with at least three budgets at the same time, right? But um, you have a part of the year where you're particularly focused on the budget, the next budget. Um, you then sort of cycle through the quarters, quarter one, quarter two, quarter three. Things that are happening all at the same time on an ongoing basis are your warrant process, are the acceptance of grants and gifts. And then the other thing that we didn't really talk about, because um, it's not really covered under an MGL, um, is the relationship that you have with your towns and the relationship that you have with the state. Um, and there isn't any place where I can point to a Massachusetts general law that says that that's part of your job. Um, however, it, it is really in terms of that, um, that sort of two directional um, responsibility that you have, you are the fiduciary responsibility for your school district. Um, so having a, a solid understanding of what your job is, first of all, but secondly, of feeling a great deal of comfort with your budget and with um, the decisions that are made at the district level makes you then much more able to go to your FinCom, to your town meeting, to your select board and be able to advocate for that budget. Um, the place to have the conversations about where are we spending the money, what are we doing with it, how is it working, is at your own table. Once you've done that, then you really need to be able to go to the town side and also the state side um, and say, you know, we're making good decisions, we're being responsible, we have good relationships, um, and here is what the district needs in order to be able to be high functional. So. Um, I always say that make sure that your town side doesn't only see you once a year when you're asking them for millions of dollars. Um, however, it is that that relationship works. Um, it should be some sort of an ongoing one. Um, but the more the, the relationships here are solid, the better able you are to then advocate your district. Now, I laughed a little because when I had a conversation with Bob last week, he suggested that I could use my own experience um, in terms of this. <laughs> and I will. But I will caution you that it doesn't that it, it it hasn't necessarily you know sort of worked out rosy. Um, so when I first <laughs> um, we had a persistent um, story from our city manager that they were funding the Western Public Schools at five or ten percent of our foundation every year. It's happening, and and we knew this was not the case, right? Like we have the numbers. We we are funded at foundation. We have been funded as, at foundation pretty much since we had. Since the dawn of time, since since education was born, um, and the first thing that happened is that our CFO spent a lot of time walking the school committee through exactly how our budget went together. Now, we're Worcester, you know, chapter seventy sheet comes out, and that's our budget plus transportation. There's there's nothing else that's happening. Um, but the the first thing was for us to all be very grounded in how our revenue stream worked, where did the money come from, exactly how much did we get, how did it work, and then. Then we called in the big guys. We actually had a meeting with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, where they explained to part of our city council that no, actually the annual reports that the Western Public Schools submits to the department were showing quite clearly that we were funded at foundation and that this historically had actually been the case. Um, and then we stopped having that dumb conversation. Now, in a perfect reality, that would mean that they started changing it. It just instead meant that we all agreed that this is how much we were funded. Um, I will also say that that did, though, make us all much more effective when we went and fought with the state about the state funding and the Student Opportunity Act. Um, but I will say that that um, 
common understanding that sort of like, where does our money come from? How does it get allocated? What does it, what's the working relationship between the state revenue and the local revenue? Um, and then being confident at the local level to be able to say, you know, here are the resources that are coming into us from other places. Here's the resources that we're asking you for. Um, and again, on an ongoing basis, we're very transparent in terms of how we spend it. We're checking regularly to make sure the money is going where we think it's supposed to be going. Um, I think it gives a greater degree of trust, certainly for the towns, um, whether the town leadership necessarily comes on board or not, but certainly the, the larger community um, sees that in terms of the leadership that you're giving them for this year. And I don't know, I don't know to what extent you can answer this. Like I understand, you know, supporting budgets in terms of student achievement and all and mm -hmm. and, and budget for and like you know projections based on contracts, based on all that. I have a question about facilities management, mm -hmm. right? To what extent? Uh, so we, I mean, this is coming from some personal experience, and you know, right? That you know, we had we had an example, for example, an elevator that was on its last legs, and we continued to tell the town it's on its last mm -hmm. legs, didn't get the money for mm -hmm. it, and it ended up being a real disaster when yep. we had to replace it, right? Um, and now we have a new facilities director, and we're finding all sorts of unattended issues that have accumulated and sure. you guys fantastic and, and unearthing all of this stuff but it brings to light like this question of like where is our responsibility and to what extent we participate in any of the kind of you know budget planning or or, or spotlighting for the town mm -hmm. need for you know long-term capital like yep. yeah, we have the five-year plan sure. right but how do you how do you assure people or how do you assure yourself that your annual sort of short-term spending is covering is is actually like mm -hmm. you know satisfactory to like to the needs of the facilities if I knew that, I'd be better at my job. Um, no, so let, I think you're asking, the, I mean, first of all, I want to say that you're asking the right question, right? And I think that that's the question, that should be a question that in some way the school committee is having with the administration. Maybe it's not quarterly, maybe it's twice a year, maybe it's, um, and one thing that I think that you said that is really important to point to for the town is that, um, if you if the operating budget for facilities is not appropriately supported, it becomes a capital budget problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, I've been having this conversation with local, with my own city, which is that you know it, if you don't support and then if you don't do that, then it becomes an MSBA problem, right? So um, I think that you know so because the operating budget is under your purview, the capital budget for those who for the municipal district is not. I do think that that's one that's first of all a good a good conversation just to have amongst yourself of like of the resources we have are we allocating them appropriately? Do we need more resources in order to do this? And is there a way that we can be having that conversation with our town to say you guys don't want to actually be having to replace the roof in five years or the whatever in five years? Um, let's make sure that we're actually doing this part now. Um, I, I will offer, and you know I'm. So I was appointed chair of finance operations in Worcester just over a year ago. Um, our terms start in January. And one thing that we've been doing is we've been taking advantage of the clause in the open meeting law, which allows for vis site visits. Um, so we, before we have a meeting, um, we will meet somewhere um, and we'll have the facilities director sort of teach us something. Um, so the very first one, Worcester is a brand new high school that opened in the fall, um, South High School, and we're at Shiny, new, lots of great systems. And what I knew from our longtime facilities director is the first thing that he sees when he sees a new building like that is there are so many things that can break here. Like, and we are not paying, <laughs> we are not spending enough on maintenance. And so I said, okay, Jim, I said, you've got the floor, take us to this building and talk to us about all that stuff. So we did fire suppression systems and boilers and like the alarm systems and the electric and the IT. And like, that was our introduction. Like, Y'all are really excited because we had this great ribbon cutting and we did this big deal about this new high school, but let's think about what that means. And remember, by the way, Worcester just opened a new high school like you know five years ago, and we've got another one that's under construction. So like this is very much our bailiwick right now. Now we also have buildings 
that are as old as 1890. So we did the same thing there. Okay, Jim, what, like, what, in a building like this, what do we need to know? Um, and then we can start to sort out a little bit more of, okay, so what is it that we actually need on an ongoing basis? Like, do we have enough custodial? Do we have enough um, facility staff? What kind of money do they need over the course of the year? If we're, I mean, so we had a joint meeting with our city council education committee, and one of the things we talked about was, okay, you guys keep complaining about this parking lot we haven't put in an elementary school. We've had to replace five boilers since the beginning of the school year. Guess what we're not doing this year either? Um, if you don't support our capital funding, we only have so much money, we're going to keep the heat on. Yes. Or, and we're going to make parents park on the street because those are the choices we have. Um, and I mean, I will say also the nice thing about facilities is it lends itself to illustrations, right? You can go see the whatever. Oh, the photo. <laughs> um, <laughs> do encourage people to do that as much as possible, right? Whether you have a go visit or you show the photos or you do the video or whatever, um, I think that can be really useful kind of for everybody to say, you know, it looks nice and shiny from the outside, but if the elevator fails, where are we? Yeah, I mean, I think we think so much about student achievement. We see scores, we see yes. presentations, we see all that stuff. And it's only recently in Carlisle where it's really sort of hit home, like, oh, there's something else we should be paying attention to yes. that I, I hadn't really. Um, mm -hmm. No, so and I mean, you have all my sympathy for that because I, I think that, I mean, we should certainly at a school, you know, don't, don't, we don't ever want to get trapped into the all we talk about is buildings and budgets. Mm -hmm because at the end of the day, we're about student achievement, mm -hmm. but there's also very good data around the fact, not that shiny new buildings lead to higher test scores, but that kids absorb a, le a message mm -hmm. from the buildings though, and that matters. Yes. And you have to be able to turn the lights off. What other things, because true. Policy. Yes. So your D. Yes. Bucket. I assume you did have something to do with that. I did. Um, and our D bucket is out of date. 2016 is when we overhauled, but they just did a big overhaul in 2022. We did. So it'd probably be good if we could squeeze that in this year. I, I, the I want, D policies. Yes, the D policies. So, um, and I think we should. You have differentiated. Regional versus we have and yep. I think that'd be really useful and drove the Masbo list sort of half out of their minds in terms of okay but we're now going to go back and change a bunch of them because the purchasing policies didn't agree with what the auditors were planning for the ESSER grant and that's the one final question I have I I probably didn't miss it but we still are waiting for guidance on the um... the office of the inspector general has yes I sent them another email last week and said I don't mean to harass you because I know exactly what that's like but just confirm for me that I haven't actually missed mm -hmm. and they said you haven't actually missed um it's still coming yes yeah, and then you just explain email. all of that for people of that don't I should. That's very interesting. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the um, the the legislature um, last term um, had some pressure from some districts in terms of changing um, the law around purchasing. Right. So you may you don't need to know all of this. Let me start this. You I, you have people for this, so don't you don't need to memorize this. It also is in your policy. Um, there are particular requirements in terms of the, the amount of money you're going to spend and what you have to do in order to spend it, right? Um, it's a public bid law, Chapter 30B. So there is a vision to it just for school districts, not for municipalities, um, which provided basically a little bit more flexibility. So that happened and a whole bunch of people were very excited. Um, and the Office of the Inspector General um, usually issues guidance for that kind of thing. They're the ones that actually oversee the purchasing law. And so I had a conversation with them after it was passed and I said, okay, the other thing that of course usually would happen after a law changes like that is we would change our policies because we actually do have that level of detail in your policies intentionally, we didn't before, because the auditors, when they were looking at the ESSER grants, were looking for it. So I sort of created my own trap here. <laughs> um, so I, I had a couple of conversations with the Office of the Inspector General and I said, so should I move ahead on writing the policies? Um, and they said that their feeling was that there were enough inherent contradictions within the revision of the law that they were actually going to need to spend some significant time <laughs> working on the guidance. And their advice was that, no, we should not move ahead with yeah. policies. Yeah. Um, and that is now also now what I share with school committees whenever I have one of them sort yeah. of chomping at the bit to change their policy of, look, like we only give guidance on policy. We give model policy. I'm going to tell you what the, I, I, you know, the OIG said to me. 
And then you can go talk to your legal counsel about what, whether they want to actually go ahead and change that. And I've definitely gotten some pretty firm no's from legal counsel based on that. So yes, um, at this point, the, the gentleman in the, in the, um, I, the OIG and I are on a first name basis and <laughs> he knows what I'm waiting for. Um, yeah, so we'll turn that around as soon as, as soon as there's anything that comes out that's clearer. Good. I do point out, by the way, to districts that it isn't that you're you're it, um, you aren't breaking the law by continuing to follow the policy. You're just not embracing a new level of flexibility. Um, you you can you could simply continue to adhere to the higher standard regardless. Yeah, I think our policy is written to just follow the law. We don't know specific thresholds that I see here. If you have the 2016 version, yeah, then we do. That you would. Yes. Yeah. It was in 22 that I put the thresholds in because you might remember that whole kerfluffle over people getting letters from the auditor's office and uh, on their ESSER grants. And you might not have gotten one because you probably have you probably had procedures that were strict enough that it, it covered it. But this involved my learning that the DESI auditors don't have any distinction between procedure and policy, which Disturbs me, but that's okay. We all have our we all have our roles. <laughs> Anything else? Any yeah. other questions, comments? This has been very helpful. Yeah, Good. thank you. Good. I'm thank glad. you very much. I was glad to do it. I'm always glad to get these these questions. Um, I, I I will say that I think that you know school police do a lot of important things, but. Um, having good working relationships around money is, I think, really, really important. And I, um, I one of the things that that um, the field directors say is that, you know, people um, just sometimes communities get their impressions of how the schools are doing only through their school committees. Um, and I always think that, you know, they get their impressions of how the budget is working and how you're fiduciarily doing by virtue of the working relationships that you have with your superintendent and your school business official um, around the budget. So um, I think that you know greater trust around this table leads to greater trust kind of everywhere else. Good note to end on. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, I think most of you have my contact information. Yes. Certainly, if I can be helpful in any way, get in touch. But thank okay. you guys so much. Don't talk to me. Yes. Yeah. And I should mention that we're we're able to like check something else off of our goals this year because this is part of our goals. So thank you so much for coming. We appreciate your time and we will definitely still be in touch. Good. Excellent. Thank you. Right. We're glad to come out here, as I said. Right. All right. Let me just find my agenda now. Moving on. Um, and we're moving on to the reading of the minutes. So we have the minutes from December 6th to approve tonight. We should have gotten those from Aaron. Mm -hmm. Move to approve for both districts. Second for both districts. Okay, any discussion? Thanks for the little edits that were made. Very good. Great, all right, all in favor? Aye. All right. All right. And on to our chairs and superintendents report. Correspondent. Oh, sorry, I skipped correspondence. How did we do that? Yeah. Go ahead, <laughs> Carrie. Carrie, you can start for Concord. Uh, for Concord, we just had one correspondence. It was um, following the DEIB meeting. Um, just asking a couple follow-up questions. And thanks for having me. Okay, I'm just gonna grab mine. Sorry, I just have to find. Fine. I believe we had three pieces of correspondence at the region. Two were from um, the same person regarding our DEIB workshop, and the third was from a student in another district, which Dr. Hunter is going to follow up on. And now we'll move on to our chairs and superintendents report. I'm going to start with you, Carrie, for Concord, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So um, this week, Dr. Hunter, Bob, uh, Alex, and I are going to be meeting with um, Peggy Briggs and um, Parashar about um, the Delta CPS budget and the Delta that currently exists. So uh, more on that at our next meeting, but we're meeting with them tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then at the region, uh, we all we were all at the DEIB workshop last week, which I thought was great from Dr. Blake and Dr. Warnham. And just for anyone that may be listening, a report will be following that. Um, we had the presentation, but they'll submit a report to the district. So we'll see that. And then we will push that out. Yeah, to the anytime. It's due the end of the month. Yeah. Tracy, yeah. does that conclude our current contractual agreement with them? Or do they have more in the pipeline with us? I believe that concludes yeah, once, we get, the report, once we get the report, we're that's, then we're okay. done. Thank you. Um, so that was first. And then I just wanted to give you a brief update on Verizon, which is we talked about this way back 
uh, about a potential cell, cell phone tower on the high school campus. We, nothing has happened so far. Hopefully a surveyor is coming out shortly to just look at the campus. And then our goal is to get Verizon in here with us to talk about what their findings are on the campus. So nothing's happened yet, but that is more to come probably in February on that. Um, Question? Yep. Are, are we of a mind that uh, one new tower will suffice or is the is Verizon still looking at a potential of two? Oh, they, I think they're looking for a potential of a second someplace else in town Thank you. to improve coverage in the town. We, however, are looking for one of the high schools. Right, no, I, I understand that. Yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I do think they still need a second site right. to improve Thank that you. coverage. Um, tomorrow we are starting, Alexa and I will be hosting a chairs round table here at Ripley. I think Jack's coming from Carlisle. We have, um, let me think, Belmont, we've invited Belmont, Lincoln, Sudbury, Bedford, Weston. I think that was it. So we should have probably, you know, six, maybe six people here tomorrow to just have an open discussion about, you know, what's happening in districts, what are you seeing, and just kind of a sounding board for helping each other, kind of like a chair support group, I would like to call it. It's very casual. So we'll let you know in our next meeting how that goes. Um, I think and it's great you're doing that. Yeah, yeah, so I think it'll be good. I think it's always good to interact with other school committees. I think we all enjoyed the conference when we had the opportunity to do that. So this way, it's just a good way to see what's happening out there. Yeah, so yeah, it, this is totally. Yeah. Well, uh, but I don't know if this kicked off something, but also the CEFs from, well, the EFs, I guess, yeah. right? Yeah. The Ed Funds from a whole bunch of towns are currently organizing a similar oh, cool. kind of support group yes. coffee kind of thing. And, and they, I, they I they feel like it might that have been okay. I don't know. They tried to do that before, like many years ago, and it never really took off. I think there's so yeah, good. There's an appetite for it. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great. So, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, and then I'll give it to Dr. Hunter for her report. Yeah, I really just wanted to note one fairly significant piece of information that came to us yesterday. Uh, the state is creating an emergency homeless shelter at the Best Western by the Rotary. Uh, so DESE commissioner's office call, I, I guess they've been working really hard to talk with the Department of Housing and Development so that there's at least a little bit of lead time to the school districts, which I uh, smiled when she said, you're getting a whole two weeks to know that <laughs> people are going to be placed there and reminded me that hadn't been the case in other situations. So we don't have very much or any other information. I've been in touch with uh, Carrie LaFleur, Concord Town Manager. She's also obviously connecting with the Department of Housing and Development, trying, I think her goal is to get a meeting with them and invite all of us leaders. Um, so we're just sort of in a stay tuned process. We've started to talk with our administrators on just the readiness factor of, it's hard to get ready when you don't know exactly what's coming, but um, transportation could be an issue if kids are from Massachusetts, school of origin is in play with McKinney Vinto. So we may be cost sharing transportation back to their original school. Mm -hmm. If they're you know, migrant ELL students, we're gonna potentially have significant ELL needs. You know, the continuum is pretty large. Typically, trauma is involved just because of the homeless status. So we want to be thoughtful of mental health, academic needs, basic supplies. Um, I have lived in a community where one of these hotels houses folks. And um, it's really difficult. The, the state had undone this. The Baker administration had undone the hotels. And they're um, just the lists are too long. We're at, one list I saw today, uh, we're third in the country for number of homeless behind California, Texas. Mm -hmm. People come here, we're very generous with our policies and mm -hmm. statutes. And um, so trying to keep up with it is becoming a really significant issue statewide. Mm -hmm. So uh, DESE has, so the state produced grant money knowing this was gonna be an issue. Uh, so DESE is going to have a supply, it's $1,000 per student. Mm -hmm. It's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, we're already feeling some wraparound supports coming from the state. I have happened to be in my office with representatives Gentile and <laughs> Cataldo, and they actually had heard a whisper of it, and it all sort of happened simultaneously. So I know they're also advocating. And um, on the flip side of that, what a great opportunity to serve kids in need, and yeah. looking forward to all we can do for them and their families. And yeah, this yeah. community is going to take really good care of folks. So, Laurie, I, I can share with you that. Uh, 
the Red Cross, with which I work, has a long history yeah. with, with that very hotel. Oh, great. Um, and they have performed admirably yeah. for us over the years great. with no notice at all. Yeah, but that's at least there. well, I guess, yeah. Um, and they've been wonderful to deal with. Yeah. I hope your, your experience is the same. Yeah, so we'll uh, keep you posted. Right. To what extent will there be a share out of needs of the family, like yeah. ways that the community yep. can come to support, right. um, to help out? Yeah, I mean, I don't know, like a backpack draw. Yeah, Kristen made well. good points this morning. Yes. We were talking of definitely wanting to engage PTGs, and we know there's so many community groups that would want to get engaged. It's a little tricky without any information on who yep. the families are. Yep. So my hope, we'll see how this plays out. My you know, perfect wish list would be we start to know who the families are and be able to get a little bit ahead of that. And I'm realistic enough to say a little bit might be days. <laughs> um, so we're we're watching that need because I think you're right. There's a there's a pattern of like, just communicate and we'll have a onslaught of help. So um, we we got a little nerve. Like this is so literally 36 hours old this morning. We thought let's take another little bit among ourselves and. Uh, hope more information comes because I think this community is going to outpour. Mm -hmm. Is it definitely going to be family based? Do we know that? That's that's oh, what we're yeah. <laughs> that's what they're telling me. Um, based on the call from Miss Desi, when it comes from Desi, you know, there's children involved. So, and yet I'll say that with her qualifying, she had very little information. So it does sound like they're planning on some kids. If it was absent to... family based, we'd expect what social workers and health workers. As, as part of the approach too, if I'm correct. Yeah. I guess we'll see. I'm eight, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not sure what services well, there's an elementary school kids who have a sense of which school they would yeah we talked on that this morning. Um so it's interesting, you know, at this point in the year, like Alcott's the low total, but we've got some bigger class sizes at K and one. Mm -hmm. So we actually this morning thought we may take this family by family, look at the needs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The small gift of it being at the rotary like that, we actually have buses that are very, John Arena, my goodness, he's already sent me like what buses go by the hotel. Um, so we two schools already go by the hotel. A third would be tricky. So we may take it as it comes because we want to be sure kids are getting what they need and we don't overload any schools or you know, I create a class of 25 in first grade at Alcott just because you say they're going to go to Alcott. So you thought it's a whole hotel that. They don't know. Um, yeah. She but quietly she whispered quiet to me busy. yesterday, well, don't worry about this, but they have capacity for 100. They have 100 rooms open. OK. We don't always know what fruition will actually come with that. So it could be quite a few. It could be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it could not be. Not, not be. be. Right, right, right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> well said. Usually they take over the hotel. They've yeah. done it a couple times at Boston. Where yeah, I do believe hotel. that is the intention. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then can you just talk about what it means if they go to their home school for transportation? Yeah, just, yeah so we, under mckinney Vento, we have to do this now for any student. We tend mm -hmm. to not have very many. Um, if they lose their housing in their original community um, and go to another community, whether they are in a shelter or they double up with someone else, um, mm -hmm. mckinney Vento assures them a place in their home school yeah. with the theory that stability in school is a very important factor for kids where housing is transient. Um, so if that's the family's choice, we work with the other school district to cost share that. We have to arrange the special transportation, which I'm going to say out loud, you know, my, my comment to them was we're happy to arrange it if we can find a van and a bus driver, which is not an easy feat yeah. these days. Um, there is some funding subsidy now, sort of like circuit breaker, you claim what you spend on homeless transportation and then they subsidize it. Do you know what the percentage is? Right? It's a lot lower. I'd say, I'm going to guess 15, 20 percent. Yeah, it's not homeless. much, yeah. but it took them years to do anything. Mm -hmm. So we can submit that and get some reimbursement. This can get expensive very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll just keep you posted. I, because these students will, in turn, they'll be our students. Mm -hmm. If they decide to come to school yeah. here because they're in the hotel, they can enroll with us. Or, or they, they can choose them. if they're from Massachusetts within reason. Yeah. We're not going to cost share a trip to the Berkshires, but right. um, something within reason, yeah. we will cost share that okay. to the other communities, so. All right, so Dr. Hunter, have you heard of any other districts? Lately, uh, not lately, but when Desi rolled the grant out to us and the commissioner made note of it at the last superintendent's meeting, I think we all sat there thinking, oh, this won't pertain to me, because <laughs> they made a note of saying the emergency, how, you know, housing yes, is yes. in crisis and here's grant funding, should you, Need it, and I know I sat there thinking, well, we don't have much. To, you know, so <laughs> yeah. 
I think they're just looking for good spots to house people. They've got history in some hotels. Yep. Um, okay. You know, it's great. And then you really hope it's very short term living in a hotel with a family. Yeah, yeah. I feel like Bedford. Bedford had, Bedford yes. Had it. Yeah. yeah. It was an Econo Lodge in my community and my church. Got, they, and those people did get, they were there for months and months. And we but got very involved in supporting them. Yeah, that was one of the latest, last ones they ended. Yeah. 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 Is that the, I mean, do they give you any, will they give you any kind of idea of, of a timeline? It's, it certainly doesn't sound certain. Um, I'm hoping if there's a meeting with housing and development, they can start to, the way Desi explained it, there's, just like us, there's a lot of privacy attached to the names and the list. And so allowing the list to get shared before the move seems to have some rightful mm -hmm. process to it. So, I mean, we were today even talking like, you know, technology availability all our yeah. enrollments are electronic so we may need to go over there with computers like just even thinking through mm -hmm. um is the wi-fi adequate over there like we our our, our secondary kids can't go without wi-fi you know mm -hmm. just the layers of things we may need to attend to so. mm -hmm. yeah okay all right well thank you for no, that thank you. um and more to come when we're both here a couple weeks yeah Okay, our committee assignments. I attached the list. So we have our bargaining set up with uh, for secretaries. It'll be Cynthia and I for maintenance. It will be Carrie in court. I will be on the director of student services hiring. And then Sarah and Alexa will um, put together the superintendent's evaluation. And what we're going to try and do with that in particular, because Sarah was so kindly volunteered to help us with that, we want to move it up and do the superintendent evaluation in April. So it will be completed by May 1st. And this way it is our current committee doing the evaluation, recognizing that we didn't do it last year. So this way it will it won't be, you know, a, if if you're back with us, Sarah, great. If you're on Carlisle after this, then it wouldn't be you coming back in June for that. Yeah. So we want to wrap it up by the time so all our current members are all part of that but we've always had and now yeah. i mean after after i said like oh i don't know about the timing yeah like then i remembered like people have come stayed come on right i yeah. think that heather stayed on and came back for the actual yeah. meeting and yeah. i think that i know that it happened in carlisle that people would come back yeah. um, if they were part of the the team or even just for the evaluation right. and it might be so nice i don't know if we have to wet ourselves to any kind of yeah and i think i think it, the timing would be great because i think june gets a little crazy and the close of school and everything else so it might be a perfect time so that's going to be a little bit in flux but uh, that that's just what we're thinking right now but when, you and alexa will work that out when's our town meeting April 30th. Um, April 30th. April, Sunday, April 30th. Yeah, yeah. When is the was trying to do that. The run up to town meeting. Yeah. Is that very busy? Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, yep. um, Yours is after well, ours is based on just on when the vote is. Ours is on the town. I have not found a date for Carlisle. Yeah, yet. I don't, I don't yeah. know. We have, because we don't have to, we have a different practice than yeah, you guys. Right. Mm -hmm. We become members at basically, you must go get born in like within 48 hours yeah. after the vote um in order to sort of claim your spot or i don't know if that's so it's the vote time. not the election it's the vote not it's the town meeting yes there's no second no it's and do you know when your election is i don't ask me why i spent time doing this but i looked at the web page <laughs> over the weekend and there's no dates there I know yeah. why I spent okay. time because we want to be sure. We're yeah, I don't know that we've even announced when the caucus is. Okay. Yeah. Because you know, okay. we were talking about that the other day and did not. Okay. Know there was that. kind of a TBD yeah. message on the web page. Okay. Yes. All right. It'll TBD happen. different town. <laughs> yeah. will, but you know, I love it. All right. So so that's where we um, kind of netted out there, and then I'm going to turn this over to Carrie to, as we move into policy. Um, this again, I'll just remind everyone this is our second reading of the school committee policies that were attached to the agenda. So go right ahead. Yeah, this is pretty brief. Um, unlike last time, we had so last time we discussed 14 new uh, policies that we were reviewing. Um, since then, I had an opportunity to go through all of the cross references and just make sure that that was all cleaned up. Um, I removed a few, changed a couple. And so Erin is aware of all of those edits. So 
if these are all approved tonight, she will work with um, MASD to make sure it's all updated online. Um, I've not heard from anyone in the community or the committee with any comments since last week. So um, I don't have anything new to report on the policy. So speak now or we'll vote later. <laughs> yes, exactly. So it's an action item towards the end of the agenda. Yeah. So there's one that gets uh moved to another policy, KJA to KBE. Are there any that are being dropped? Yes, think, yes. Uh, there's quite a few. Yeah, and I don't see that in the list. So when we get to the vote, if you can call that out for uh, yes, me. Yes, it's an in the, the, book, the vote language um, court it's instead of the link in the discussion. Yeah. Very yeah. good, thank you very much. Yeah, and we talked about putting in the agendas, the like old policy, the new policy. Yeah. Yeah. The link to the, it's a, it's so if you link, go to the yeah. study reading of, of SC policies, it says yeah. current, the MASC, and then a proposed under each one. Okay, I think I opened the, uh, the motion twice. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. yeah. That sets the standard for how to do this. It's, yeah, I mean, <laughs> says that was an incredible amount of work to put all that together. Yes, she did a great job at that. And I, I think she did that for us last year, and she really put it all together again. It was really, and I appreciate it because she's also been sick. So I hope you feel better, Erin. Just say that out loud. Um, but she's like the, the voice of God. In I know, she really is. She's just the <laughs> behind the scenes, you know. All right. Um, so we will look forward to that in our action items. So moving on to our FY23 budget update, which I just feel like this is really good timing given what we just did with Tracy. And it, it's really clear. I feel like for your memo and for your update. So I will turn it over to Bob. So we're on the regional district. Yeah, meeting, we're in the region. Okay, we should I talk about the right information. So I'm um, gonna just highlight the um, budget variances then talk specifically about the vehicle plan, which is in my memo. Um, so there's, there's two reports. There's the 1000 level, which is kind of the DESI function level that we've, Prove our budget on, um, and then there's a 100 level just to give you um, the kind of transparency and additional detail if you wanted to see it. Um, I'm going to talk more about the, the 1,000 level, um, and so our kind of where we see overalls. I think we're in a relatively um, decent place for the high school district, the regional school district. Um, some of these things you may have heard of um, already during the budget process, but um, on, the, on the district leadership side, the negative adjustment is reflecting the restructuring of Medco staff, which is not actually a reduction. It's just, we're not classifying it as administration anymore. And the net of these changes is actually more Medco staff. Um, the instructional leadership category, the, the main uh, Contributor to the budget adjustment there is the funding of a speech language pathologist to meet student needs um, at the high school. Um, in other student services and other school services, it's being driven by transportation. Um, 76,000 that is special ed transportation. Some of that is parent transportation. Some of that is the case, uh, uh, case collaborative assessment. And then 33,000 in homeless transportation, which um, I believe is for just one student. Um, can you check that? Yes. No, that's correct. Um, and so, Lori well, just shared the news. Um, you know, if, if students opt to stay um, in their district when they move here, um, that just kind of gives you an idea of what it costs for a student um, for homeless transportation. Is that the 114 number? Uh, the 114. This 3300. Um, oh, I just sure. Oh, the 100 sure. level. I'm sorry. Um, uh, and you're in the thousands. Yeah, level. that's yes, that's in. You're right. That's in the 3300 people transportation. Thank you. Um, so really, just between special ed transportation and homeless, that that comprises almost all of that. We have a little bit of a bump for fuel, diesel as well, and the regular ed transportation. Um, maintenance is pretty much on budget. It's within a couple thousand dollars. Uh, the fixed charges reflects our, our benefits and our insurance costs, um, our premiums on our policy. We actually have a little bit of a favorability on retiree insurance and uh, offsetting the unfavorable um, active employee insurance. Um, so the, the bulk of that um, is related to our workers' comp and property liability policies. 
we are reaching out to um, our insurance company, um, the workers' comp policy um, is not held with them currently, but by being by by now having a separate policy for our commercial insurance, we're kind of a bigger entity for them to look at having and taking us back into workers' comp. So I have a inquiry up to them to kind of push for that to happen. Um, it would be nice to have our insurance consolidated with them. And as we move farther away from um, the incidences where we had claims, our experience rate for workers' comp compensation should improve and hopefully that leads to a policy uh, cost reduction. But for FY23, that's where we are for now. Um, the fixed assets is fairly close to budget. I mean, the main driver there is, um, you might recall, and we talked about the fact that we had to replace a rooftop unit compressor. You saw a crane at the school on a weekend um, that was uh, part of that effort. Um, it's offset by a small savings on the vehicle budget, um, but really it's the increase is being driven by that um, rooftop unit repair. Um, and then the last thing is the programs with other districts, which is essentially our out of district tuitions. Um, the, um, the savings there is, is, is in part um, bringing a student back in district. Um, that actually may be a net of two coming back in district and one going out, um, but the net is one student's back in district versus what was budgeted. And the remainder is um, kind of, we're planning to use um, some additional circuit breaker of current year funds um, to offset some um, overages we have in other lines. And we'd still have a very healthy circuit breaker balance at the region. It's um, the revenue that we're gonna see this year is over a million dollars for the region. So, um, I feel comfortable doing that. Um, so that's where we are for the regional budget on the um, kind of through, not exactly through Q, it's it, Q, this is through uh, January 19th. So we run this kind of when we, shortly before the, the meeting dates and um, so you get real time information. Um, and so I'll wait for guidance from the school committee in the future, whether these get voted on and, and such, but um, right now it's information we're presenting. Um, so in my memo, we're, while we're talking about the region, I just wanted to highlight um, the um, planned uses of vehicle replacement funds. You know, in the region, we had, um, we've ordered four buses last year with the lead time supply chain issues and, and lead times. Uh, we're not the only district seeing this. It, buses do not arrive um, the month after you order them anymore. Um, and um, so we had 122,000, 124,000 in lease costs that um, would have hit this year, but we already encumbered the first year last year. So we're not gonna have any expense for that this year. So that created a, um, a balance that we had accessible. Um, we, we are moving forward with two acquisitions, um, one purchase and one lease. We're only able to do the purchase because of that savings um, of not having those leases. In addition, we have a need for a maintenance truck. We have a very old truck that's not roadworthy, will not pass inspection. Um, we would um, uh, uh, checked with Ian in the past. We've shared the cost. We ultimately need to register it in one district. We've shared the cost between both districts. We just will um, bill um, the other district. So the 40% share of that in Concord, Carlisle um, is 34,000. And that would leave a balance of 16,000 on the vehicle budget. Um, and for those four new vehicles, um, year two through five of the lease would be FY24 through 27, and those are factored into the FY24 budget. Um, and the way we budgeted for FY24 is that they'll be on a, a lease basis. We don't have the capacity in the budget um, to, to purchase. Um, I just have a note on lease versus buy. You know, we've um, wanted to um, deliver a budget um, that was, um, going to work for the towns the best we could. Um, and so we did go with a lease assumption for FY24. I just wanted to highlight that as interest rates rise, um, you know, it's something we may want to think about because more of our, uh, of our budget goes towards covering um, the interest 
component of vehicle acquisition, not just the principal purchase um, or the, the cost of the vehicle itself. Um, it's tricky on how you switch. Um, you need to have um, find a time to do it, and there's going to be a bump the first year you do it. Once we get to steady state, um, there is no additional cost. Um, but in the meantime, with them on lease, the first year you buy, you're going to have some on lease and a purchase. So a longer term consideration. Um, when do and, we need to make a decision on that? Um, well, we've, we've moved forward with a budget that plans for leases. Um, we would need to talk to the school committee. We probably want to assess what the town's capacity is to see a switch to, because it's going to result in a budget increase the first year we do it. Mm -hmm. There's also the possibility that, you know, mm -hmm. some of the timing of these orders, we typically wait a little bit. Um, you know, if we were to get late in the year and had money left, you know, we could make a decision as a group. Um, you know, John, at the same time, John's anxious to, to have the orders placed, mm -hmm. but if we had the capacity, in a year where we saw all of a sudden um, a decrease in other district tuitions, you might say, well, we see money in the budget. Why don't we do it as a purchase instead of the least? Um, I don't really see it as an option. I think what we've outlined this year is, is all we can do. Um, could potentially purchase one because of not having those four vehicles, first year cost of a lease at, at the high school that were, they're gonna arrive in March, mm -hmm. but their lease costs have already been encumbered in FY22 when we made the order. Mm -hmm. so. So that's the only reason we can do it this year. But we'll we'll think about that as we prepare the FY25 budget. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's all sorts of things that will be trade-offs there. Okay. I have a question. Um, so we were these buses were supposed, so if we encumber if we cumber them last year when they what what was the original anticipated arrival date? of the buses? I'm not hundred percent certain. I know it's before March. Yeah, I know it's like before, before the school, yeah, was I know uh, and I, so the four that will be replaced, we're we're still running down four that we have that we want a surplus or that are that have a lease. It's like what's what? Yeah, we what are they? What are they yeah. going when they come in? Are there four other buses that are going out, or like we're, that we extended a lease on four buses, or so, they, or is it just this is X? Like we don't have padding. We don't have extras when we would hook. I'm just trying to understand. So we only have, le their leases are five years. Yep. So only the buses that are five years old and less are on leases. Okay. So there's not that many. And I know um, we have buses over five years. So those are fully paid for. Yep. So I think what John will want to do, well, I know what John will want to do is is to transfer, you know, trade these, you know, some of these, he has a couple that are like not being used, um, but he will want to, you know, turn in the ones that are not roadworthy, potentially for if he can get a trade in, if they're in good enough condition to get a trade in. If they're not, he'll take scrap value for them. But we will look to disposition and we'll bring those to the school committee when we so do we're that. We're overusing some that we had hoped Yeah, we're massaging some along. I was just trying to understand. Like, yeah. What, yeah. 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 What he says sometimes, he gets anxious, you know. They, they, yeah. the, they can be, I'm not questioning, yeah. I'm not like saying, oh my gosh, yeah. wow, like, we, you know, yeah. we, we could have gone further if we got an extra six, six months. No, that's not, yeah. that's not my, my, my question. We just, is you know, just, cross our fingers. They where are we on the process? Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 I'm making sure we had enough buses around yes. right yeah. now, like, that we're not, yeah, I mean, I'm hopeful though. Shortage of buses. Yeah. But this kind of supply chain really does start to make you nervous, yeah. admittedly. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so, we'll see. So if we do get four in place in order for two in each district, that gives us eight. Um, it, it, it buys time. He, you know, John is, you know, these buses are safe. That's not the issue. The just though they could potentially fail inspection because of some, you know, some oh, he's issue. Done, he's yeah. given us a bunch of information yeah. on the state of the buses. And yeah. I think, I think yeah. I understand that. So, um, so that's where we are. And again, yeah, the older ones would be retired. Um, and I have I left a note there on just kind of the mechanics of our process. So it looks like the budget's available, but there's reasons why we could potentially look at modifying our process. But um, since they're ACH wire payments, it's a little bit harder to encumber the funds than it would be for a normal PO where you cut a check. Um, so when you look at the budget reports, that money, um, those leases uh, are going to be paid. Um, it just doesn't show as encumbered. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that some of the available funds, the remaining balances you see, 
it's the same thing with um with, with benefits um you know there are funds that um show available but they're they're going to be spent down is this i mean is this a new problem like this the problem with the encumbering the funds no it's the way it's been done it's always been a problem yeah. it's always been a it's just the way it's, yeah, I just wanted to. I admit, I, I saw these big numbers. I'm like, Bob, what? The, <laughs> why do we have so much money there? It's a perfect storm of, usually there's probably some not encumbered, but we don't usually probably have as much because of the supply chain issue. So I think it's the combination of things. So you'd encumber um, it if you could. Yes. Yeah, we probably can come up with a like a little hokey manual way to do I mean, it. I had a superintendent once who used to add a column and, and make us sit and go through, anticipated was his word, because you couldn't quite encumber it because you didn't have the right process mechanically and accounting wise, but you also wanted to show that it was accounted for. I've never done that. And that was 1999 that we did that. I think he had his purposes. It's pretty labor intensive. It's better to kind of just know what you've got out there. Yeah, but that's like a fascinating thing for yeah. us to know because you yeah. think that like any, I always assumed like any, co any cost that you, like this is a recurring play. Like, yeah. cost that you yeah. know is kind of like, I just assume that would always go into the encumbered because it's spoken, like I always think of encumbered. It's a moment in time. Yeah, right? yeah, it's a moment of time it's, as to whether it's, it's there more or not. complicated. It's yeah. spoken for right. and linked to a PO or linked Correct. to it. Okay. Yeah, I never differentiate yeah. the 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 leases are spoken for. We've committed to it. The purchases we've all talked about and committed to it, but until we actually Purchase, order it, yeah. we can't encumber that. Um, that's not to say we couldn't create some anticipated or something um the benefits we will encumber next year we're not going to do it the same way and we'll we'll have a process to encumber that because the beginning of the year we know how many people are enrolled we should mm -hmm. we should be doing that and I, so we'll i just to do it mid-year um and change it um it's going to be a little bit much um so that is something that you'll see encumbered next year so which which of our thousand level is where those yet to be encumbered live right now. What is it? The seven thousand. Um, the seven thousand and the five thousand. Yeah. That sounds, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um. That's the report on the region. Okay. Any other questions for Bob on the region? I have a question. I mean, looking at the warrants, I have a question. Just last year, I think it was last year, Jared. Kind of reference to sophisticated um, um, formula for allocating Ripley expenses between, like for for heating and cooling and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm not asking on the spot. Can you show mm -hmm. me this formula? But at some point, like, can the school committee know the like how that's because just to understand how like the, because like I remember he talked about like I take out the gym and I take out the yeah, way he had a square footage model yeah based on square footage here based on spaces used for both region and CPS yeah, yes. that he then divided by enrollments and came up with I'm sure Ian yeah has it. I'm sure Ian has it so yeah. personnel could be an easy 60-40 personnel is easy <laughs> Like the you know the, yeah, you know, the utilities, the, the utilities, right, the things right. like that. Like just to so that we can understand Stand what right. is. Yeah, yeah I'm sure. Yes, yeah. was covered by the town. Was covered by the region. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. no, I can I can I correct it then. I know I've seen it for capital. Um, I can. I yeah, can no, this was at utilities, and like we didn't charge Carlisle for the gym space that only CPS kids are using. So let's see. Same yeah, lab. yeah, yeah, yeah. Same, same lab, same everything thing. else. Yeah, yeah. There. So if you look at it overhead. Like a third. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah, no, it matters. Yeah. We wouldn't Carlisle shouldn't pay for spaces in Yeah. No, I remember they're doing that. It'd it be good to be current on that before Carlisle asks us to be current on it. Yeah. 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 Bringing more kids to our school and then we're charging them, it's crazy. <laughs> we did have a lovely meeting with the Carlisle. Yeah, we did. Oh, <laughs> great. oh, you did? We did. Oh, yeah, I should have reported out on that. See, yeah. Yeah. January, we had a lot of meetings in January. Um, I'll just mention that we went, Bob, Lori, and I went, and Sarah went to Carlisle FinCom. It was actually wonderful. And I think that it, they had the, his, the history, they were planning for this influx of kids to come in. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't, you know, a huge deal. Like it was, no, we, we saw this five years ago. We knew this was going to happen. So it was great. 
That's good because it is the biggest swing we've seen. Right. Yeah. It's right. bigger than any swing the Concord had. Yeah. It's like some yeah. proportional. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. It's mm -hmm. a huge so it is a big deal, but it was yeah. not unanticipated. A big deal, but anticipated. It was anticipated yeah. and planned for. So, yeah. so, so it's a non controversial big deal. There we yes. go. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. To that point, how do you run those numbers? Like, did you know two years ago? Did you know a year ago? That, well, I mean, one is what we talked about that we knew that last year's eighth grade graduating mm -hmm. eighth grade class was an exception, was a large, was a bubble, mm -hmm. right? And so there was there was that. Um, we have a few people in town who really like to take deep dives mm -hmm. into projecting out. Yeah, um, and, and this office has done more. And, actually, and I think there support was from event, some I of your think folks. As long as I've been on the school committee yeah. here for the two years, I think we, I feel like even it was brought up two years ago, yeah. mm -hmm. kind of. And so I think it's just a lot of eyes, which is great, yep. and a lot of open yep. conversation um, and sharing of information. So it would be good, a nice. For both towns to have like a two or three year. So we've outlook. got at their request, at Ryan McLean's request, we projected out how many years? Do you remember who we gave them? I think it was three. another five oh, years. Yeah, we'll five. send you the model. Yeah. Presentation yeah. we use those five years. Yeah, we'll send you yeah. the model. But even though it's a big swing, it's still not. Because if they reference back like 10 years ago, it's still kind of the same number of kids, but because they yeah, you've had some declines, they've had and some decline, and so now we're so, rebounding from that. Yeah. So it's not as though it's like all of a sudden, you know, we have all these kids moving to Carlisle, it's kind of ebbs and flows, right? It, yeah, oh, yeah, no, 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 yeah. it's it's part of a site like next year is not going to, right? We're not on a we're not like, oh, last year was 80 kids in the eighth grade, and now with 90 kids, and yeah. 100. Yeah, 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 no, 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 we have uh. You know, we have we have we have bigger years and we have smaller yeah. years and um and if you look over the historical changes then it's and you I need mean, us to inform what? you on the Concord side because right. Concord's enrollment's got a declining trend so the combination of the rebound yeah. in Carlisle and the yeah. decline in Concord is it could be a it could be a trend I mean the crazy thing and I told you this yeah. right is that I look back at some mosquito mosquito information about enrollment and. When the high school, before the high school opened, just before it opened or when they were building, whatever, the, the NASDAQ project projections for number of kids, they thought that there were going to be 1,600 kids in the high school by now, right? 1,500 yep. when the school opened and 1,600 now. The crazy thing is the number of Carlisle students for 2023 was spot on. Mm -hmm. like, exactly. It was like off by one kid, right? So... That was correct. <laughs> that was. I don't think. I don't think I would glean anything from that in terms of reliability of the numbers. Right. I just find it fascinating. Yeah. That, yeah. Well, Carlisle had the mosquito had really accurate reporting of that that you could go back and reference and and look at the history there. So yeah. that was great. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, thank you, Bob. I think that's terrific. Um, and then I think we're moving on to our action items. So we're going to vote to approve our policies first. And you should have a motion in the agenda. No, I guess yeah. carried a. Do you yeah. have them ready? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I move that the Concord and Concord Carlisle school committees vote to approve school committee policies KBA, KBBA, KBE, KCD, KDB, KDD, KHA, KHB, and KI as discussed, and remove KBBAE, KBBAR, KCB. KCDA, KCDAR, KHE, and KJA. Second. It's a mouthful. For both. It's a mouthful. <laughs> and any discussion? I thank the work of the policy committee, I have to say. I mean, this is there's a lot of policies that we've been able to get through. So yeah. team effort. Thank you for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All in favor? All right. Aye. 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 Okay. Approved. All right, and then we have um, a vote to surplus the vision machines, and I believe these are the the uh, vision testing machines at yeah. at the high school. And you, if anyone just has for that. the region, right? Just for the region, yes. Because we have to do separate. You, we Aaron suggested you could do both, and then not have to do the Concord. It's really up to you. Um, well, why not? Because oh, at one point, we we could pull, it is I, for both. I think we pulled it just to the to the joint. Oh, okay. So, so let's. So this is yeah. going to be for both. Okay. 
So because we're in person, just say I for both if you're region, I guess. Right. <laughs> if you're right. if you're both and just region. Okay. Okay. Um, does anyone have that motion in front of them? Yes. Uh, I move that the Concord and Concord Carlisle School Committees vote to donate five vision machines as outlined to the Lions District 33 and Visual Aids Foundation. Second. Okay, discussion? Do the Lions know these are coming? Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh. Thank you. Okay. I had to stop them from going until you approve them, so they're, they're excited to get them. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay, great. Hey, all in favor? Aye. 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 I was really confused to do that, but I, okay, I'll just say any opposed? Anyone opposed? All right, at this point, um, before Carlisle leaves, I just want to mention that we have not forgotten we need to schedule a February or March school committee meeting in Boston. So that is, I'm going to be working on that, and maybe we can talk and maybe have like a little social before the meeting, mm -hmm. something like that. We'll, we'll be adding a meeting. We know it will take change, the place of one of our change, school okay. meetings at Ripley. It will just go on location to Boston. We're hopefully going to Hyde Park to the yes. library. Um, and where, I think we can we just, we're going to have to bring the gadget. Yeah, in. I think we can just bring our gadget yeah. here. Yeah, that will make things, will much, make easier. things much easier. Otherwise, we didn't have a plan. It's great. Right, yeah. right. So, all of this really needed to be the in place so we could get it. The owl owl trap. Trap. Yeah. No, MMN's got one uh, okay. camera on, and then the owl's got the split. The owl is the split camera. It's got three cameras the owl is at the same time. Pretty smart. I like it. We'll have to listen to the sound quality. So, hopefully, anyone watching well, can make Aaron's on the call to tell me if it's not working. Well, we so have the DIC piece. We have that one also. I haven't it. watched that one yet. It's on, no. It's up on All right. I'll have to check it out. All right. <laughs> well, thank you. So thank you to Carlisle. And I am going to adjourn the region. Good night. That's it. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. And I'm going to do a meeting in a row. And we had a workshop tonight. Amazing. This is great. Um, so do we so, want to just power through? Or yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, I think we can power through. So Carrie, as you know, is chairing because Alexa is on a plane as we speak. So I will turn it over to me. And I will turn it over to Bob. <laughs> We're gonna go through the oh, middle school. Oh, sorry, this sorry, middle school update. Thank you, Cynthia. Yeah, so this is brief. Um, so last Thursday, I think over 1,200 people came to CCHS for the special town meeting and overwhelmingly approved the additional funding for the middle school. So a big thank you to the community for that mm -hmm. um, and to Court and Alexa, who is not here, and Dr. Hunter um, on the building committee. I know and many hours went into that. So thank you and congratulations. So Thursday morning, 730, we look at the all deduct list uh, to protect the project with the now budget. Great. That's correct. And Bob's been working a lot on the pre-approvals of the vendors. So. Which is done. In qualification. It's done. Yeah. Oh, great. So that's the two big items. So then we have the vote on February 16th um, yeah. at the ballots, and right. from there, break ground in the spring. Right. What are the bids? Uh, the bids go end of February. So that's a pretty big one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, do you do the pre qual or does the OPM do it and report to you and the town? So they offered for. Me, uh, Gail, the CFO, town CFO is on the committee, um, uh, Lorraine Finnegan from um, SMMA, right. and Ian and um, a few people from Hill. And so in other districts, they said just Hill and SMMA, like the, the design consultant and the OPM have done the evaluations. Gail and I felt like we wanted to not just say, yes, that's fine. So we split up and each assigned, uh, we're assigned kind of half of the subcontractors and we, we both fit the GCs. Um, so we were involved with it. Um, you know, in certain cases we were, you know, kind of deferred to their professional opinion, but these packages were standard. So we were, we were pretty involved. Well, I was with half the trades and Gail half the trades. And we also got to hear what the evaluations were for each. So it was, it was an interesting process, and uh, Ian will share more about it tomorrow. Not, you know, most people were pre-qualified, but some were not. Um, so, good. But I think, I think a pretty good pool.
Anything else on those four? Well, we're hopeful that uh, bidders are looking for 2024 work. Mm -hmm. Yep. Nice response to the pre call. So mm -hmm. it's yeah. promising. Yeah. Sorry, right. Sharon's kids are distracted. You want to wait? Oh, <laughs> They're gone. Yeah. Um, okay, so the next item is Bob's budget update. Yeah. And so I'll run through the same things as I did for <laughs> CPS. I also just wanted to, to say um, thank you for your patience as this, this came out a little bit late. I think um, I appreciate Lori and um, the chairs giving me um, information that. Um, and suggestion to put a little bit more detail on the vehicle replacement to outline it. Just, it's, I think it's easier to get that to people up front instead of having questions in the meeting. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, and again, that was kind of um, what held it up a bit. Um, what I didn't mention for CC uh, RSD, but also applies to both districts, is that when we look at these reports, um, and this may not have always been done in um, prior years, is we've already applied all the IDA grant funds um, to offset special education expenses. Um, we've applied all of the prior year um, circuit breaker carryover funds to offset special education expenses. And we've used an additional 285,000 in CPS, um, consistent with what we budgeted to do. So we've applied circuit breaker, uh, applied IDA. In addition, we've applied um, essentially all of the special ed ARPA funds. There's a small amount um, of ARPA funds for supplies and materials left. And essentially all of the ESSER II funds have been spent down. ESSER III funds have been allocated to be used as we planned and communicated in our budget presentation, leaving the FY24 amounts available. Um, so I just did want to highlight that. In term, when you think about, you know, we've talked about a little bit of budget pressure. We do have it eased a bit um, and, and it's helping us, these things, um, particularly the ESSER funds and the SPED ARPA are helping us manage this um, in FY23. Um, so um, just some context for, you know, our balances are apparently um, manageable at this point, um, but as we get through the year, you're gonna see, um, we're not gonna be able to apply these funds anymore. Um, so at the CPS level, um, the items I kind of highlighted for where the budget adjustments were, the most significant is um, in instructional leadership, um, a teaching and learning category. Uh, the, the majority of that is related to classroom teacher salaries due to savings on uh, replacement hires, also on leaves of the absence where we're typically replacing with um, a lower cost teacher. Um, and some of those actual costs for the, for the subs will show up in a different line. Um, we also have, um, that's offset by additional special education tutors and assistants to support our intensive needs programs and students in those programs. We've added um, a BCBA uh, full-time um, and that's in the medical therapeutic line. Um, that's also offsetting that uh, teachers the, the, the decrease to teacher salary increases. So, so on a net impact, the decrease in instructional leadership is about 165,000. Um, and that's offset in other lines, um, most significantly in other school services uh, for transportation, 49,000 of that is for special education transportation, which is our case transportation assessment. Um, and all, we also have a one-to-one -one nurse um, for a student that, that requires a nurse for transportation for $32,000. Um, the fixed charge increases is essentially our insurance costs for workers comp and property and liability, um, which you may recall we talked about during our look at the budget. Um, and then there's relatively small variances in community uh, services and fixed assets. Um, and then in programs with other districts, we have a increase of 42,000. Um, when you look at, uh, which doesn't fully kind of reflect um, where we are there. Um, if you look at the last column on the far right for remaining balance, we have a deficit of 199,000 for out of district, uh, for programs with other, other districts, primarily um, out of district tuitions. We're planning to use an additional $100,000 in current year circuit breaker um, to offset this. Um, we will evaluate whether there's opportunities um, and savings later in the year to help offset it, excuse me. Um, and we anticipate being able to offset the remaining 
100,000 through um, identifying some reductions to other budget lines, which um, that work is started, uh, it's not yet completed. So I do think overall we're in okay shape um, from the uh, fact that we're able to um, kind of leverage the ESSER funds, the SPED ARPA funds. You know, there's, there's still unknowns. We don't know, you know, if, if teachers are gonna be out on leave and um, we'll need to cover that and be paying them while they're on leave in a long-term sub. Um, you know, so we're, we're in January. Um, we'll have more of a comfort level as we move forward. Um, so, but that's where we are now. And, um, you know, schools are fluid entities. Um, this is yeah. a point in time and um, we'll adapt and um, give you updates as we move forward. Mm -hmm. When we got to guideline last <clears throat> spring, which you'll remember took a while, mm -hmm. there was an awareness that we could and would likely need to use some of those funds, which is partially why you're looking at a 5% increase for 24, because there are no funds there to count on, as are certainly, um, other than what we identified. It's not just sitting there waiting to fill holes for us. We've got to be careful with circuit breaker. We're trying to be thoughtful that we don't dip too deep into that. So one story becomes the next year to year. So do you anticipate that we'll have an FY24 discussion at our next school <laughs> city meeting after the spring time meets on Thursday? I think that was Alexa's intent. Mm -hmm. Okay. It so. may depend if it's productive or what comes of it, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm certain we will we'll report out. We've been going back through FY24. We spent a long time on that this morning to see what we can find. So we'll have some information. What's this year's circuit breaker? You said that. Um, so well, we our carried, yeah, ahead, we yeah. carried over 400 and I don't know the exact number, but somewhere between four and 500,000. Yeah. And that's all applied, you said. That's all applied, uh, plus uh, an additional 285,000 has been applied, right. um, which was what was budgeted. We budgeted to use 725. Um, and but the revenue we're receiving this year um, is in the 900 range. So we budgeted to increase our usage. Mm -hmm. um, it would be nice to carry over a full amount, but we're not going to we're not going to be doing that. So, um, <clears throat> so it's nine hundred k less two eighty five. What? No, less a hundred that he may recommend applying. Yeah, against, well, I plan to use a hundred up to nine hundred against. Okay, so we have a balance of around eight. Well, we don't yet, but we will by the end of the year. No, I'm yeah. saying that's, yeah. that's your expectation. The hope yeah. for carryover. That's the hope for carryover. Okay. I mean, I, I've, you know, you'll see we're 199,000 over for programs above the districts. Um, we're assuming we, we'll use 100. If we're able to find um, savings in other lines, I, I don't mean to say that's kind of, I'm just going to take it for granted. I mean, we need to mm -hmm. identify it, but that would mean we don't need to use another 100 of circuit breaker. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, your intentions are not your commitments to. Uh, I guess that's what I wanted yeah, to be sure you yeah, heard as we yeah, do we, go back to the you know we discussion. Yeah, we're yeah. dipping into stuff that right. we were stably mm -hmm. not using. Mm -hmm. So, and we knew it, and that's fine, but I don't know that that's the pattern mm -hmm. we want to yeah. hold, yeah. which is why the 5% is in front of you. And, and I, I, you know, we have a significant variable. Um, that could, could be occurring mm -hmm. um, that with new students moving yeah. to the district mm -hmm. that uh -huh. um, you know just yeah. adding Did students by themselves, it. regardless mm -hmm. of whether they need any yeah. support. So we can't really quantify. Oh, no. yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to, right yeah. now with, with the yeah. snapshot. Um, I just have a question on there's a line to a professional development line that that basically zeroed out almost line two, three, five, six. I'm just wondering. Uh, there's other professional development lines. Yeah, we there was a professional development line for substitutes, which I just moved to the substitute line. I just took the money and said, let's. No, it's two, three, five, six. There, I, that's a separate line. Yeah, I believe it's professional development um, substitute teachers to pay. The one below that. Oh, okay. Special ed conferences, workshops. I mean, Bob's notes. But it's zeroed out um, essentially. Oh. They're kind of like we, we had other. Yeah. We had other funding for that, so we were able to borrow some of that. Okay. Or, you know, a year ago, Debbie made a budget 
she'd been here five seconds. <laughs> so yeah. some of the sped lines we've been able to revisit for PD, not for tuitions, but for other things that she put in for and either use other funds or lower those numbers a little bit. Yeah. So she does have fun access yeah, to other funds. Other funds. And then just a question on, you mentioned it briefly, the, the 360, 360K reduction on classroom teachers. Mm -hmm. That was caught by? So it's a combination of, of savings on replacement hires. I know a lot of that was at the middle school. Yeah. In fact, the majority was at the middle yeah. school. Um, and, but it's also, there are some teachers who are on leave who are unpaid leave and being replaced by substitutes at a lower cost, long-term subs at a lower cost. Um, unpaid leave. Sorry. Yeah, there's also some unpaid leave. That, okay. Um, but, um, okay. We hired very carefully last spring. We knew the budget was tight and where we had an outgoing veteran. You know, it all didn't, we had some retirements that didn't come to fruition, but the ones that did, we were very, very careful. And if we could hire a less experienced person and use the Delta to help offset some other things that happened, um, we were probably the most intentional we've ever been about that. So a good portion of it's that. I believe one of the positions also is um, is um, was ESSER fund, was budgeted as ESSER funded, and you know so we had some offset from that um, in the language based program. And then the one other question was the instructional software line uh, doubled from 93 to 194. Uh, That's just how you're tracking it, Bob, right? Yeah, I think there's two instructional software accounts. And um, okay. is it 2451 and 2455? So 2453. Actually, that's oh, I see one went down. Seven, yeah, I see. it's just the way we're logging them. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. So the, the vehicle I, I've highlighted as well. It's um, it's a little bit more straightforward there um, in terms of there's no um, purchase. There are two additional leases. Um, and um, so I've kind of outlined what the use of those funds would be for the year uh, for CPS. Um, and, we, and when we look at the FY24 budget, we did move towards a lease assumption. So uh, there was a little bit more capacity this year. We hadn't fully moved to the lease assumption. I think there is um, some hope that we might be able to transition back to a purchase one, but we did make a decision during this year's budget process to uh, make an assumption of leases for FY24. Um, and if I'm correct, that's a, a lease purchase with a five-year acquisition yes. timeline? Okay. Yes. Um, and so that's that's the update for CPS. Okay. Any other questions? No, thank you for all this. I mean, I, I really think that tonight this was helpful given the fact that we had the workshop too. Yeah. Like I was like, oh, it's all like making sense at the same time. So what, what, would, what would approval uh, look like and sound like? Because as Bob said earlier, we have kind of de facto tacitly approved things. Um, if we were to bump that up in the interests of accountability and transparency, what would it what might it sound like? Just uh, that we, 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 does anybody know? Yeah. Like maybe in your, in your former district, who did you, what, what did your motion language look like? In, in our former district, we yeah. did it after the fact, but we would actually vote uh, to approve the adjustments as presented at the meeting on a quarterly basis. A quarterly so basis. we'd be doing exactly what we're doing here. All we would do is add a vote to it, which is not exactly what Tracy was referring mm -hmm. to in her opinion is best practice. If you ask everybody in my seat, um, they would say quarterly transparency mm -hmm. would be close to that practice. I could just not post the transfers and carry negative variances. That's what some districts do. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's defeating the, the spirit of it. Um, mm -hmm. I think if we're going to do something, you know, we'll we'll work with what the school committee wants to do. I think we need more time to talk about it if yeah. you want to do it and think about it. What would be difficult is if um, something comes up and we need to do something and then 
I need to talk to Lori. Lori needs to stop, and we can't do it because we need to get school committee approval to do a transfer. Mm -hmm. so, well, that, that but that's different. You know, yeah. accepting this as submitted is different than looking for pre-approval. No, right, I right, that's right. Not. right. So, that's and, not and what you described first is actually our, our common practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, without us saying how much of this is going to happen tomorrow and how much of this happened yesterday. You know, that's a level of granularity that I don't think anybody's ready to right, entertain. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do think we, we, we're we almost there. I mean, we can get closer to best practice by just approving these as we present them in the future. Okay. Um, and then if you, you know, if you have some thresholds where you say, listen, please let us know in advance if, um, I, I can't uh, think of something. If we had, if we had like a whole host of new students Moving in, and we had to add five teachers. We would need to tell you that. Yes, right. I think we'll know about that. Yeah. 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 All right. I mean, I, I, I think it'd be uh, sensible, and I think it's a way a school committee actually uh, accepts more accountability for uh, uh, yeah. the, the the work you're doing on, on, on our behalf. Right, because so I feel like we're almost there where, where we should be, and what I'm hearing from you is if we just add one more step, then we'll get to what we should be doing for the auditors also. I think so. I mean, we do need to have a formal vote at the end of the year, where at the end of the year you approve, yeah. and we probably need to do it sooner than the audit here. Um, eventually, we try to get the timeline a little bit earlier, but um, be it, there should be a year end report where you've approved the last mm -hmm. set of numbers, yeah. and that's what I've always been asked for from auditors. Okay. We um, do. I think we do do that. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah, I think, I think you can second. Okay. I'll second. Yeah. 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 I tried to articulate my reasons for not supporting this. Uh, my abstention last time was an expression of my intent to not uh, uh, oppose it either. Um, I don't want to oppose the will of this committee, but I don't see uh, this as an appropriate uh, uh, motion on this school committee's part at this time. So this motion though isn't, the content this motion is, I mean, the, the warrant is going forward to the town meeting regardless. This is simply a, a technicality. Does that change your opinion in any way? Well, only marginally, <laughs> but you make a good point. Yeah, you make a good point. Uh, so uh, uh, it will fail because Lex is not here, the two of us have saying. So but this is only so I understand. Only I'm just saying of numbers as the I town understand. is required. Yes. And, it, and if it fails, that's fine. It will but be adjusted on the town floor, the meeting of town hall. It's a question of whether we but I know the town would rather, want to send it. The town would rather that it be correct. Exactly. Yes. Correct. The town would rather it be correct in the warrant. Which well, is what I'm going to hold my nose and support it. Yeah, and I am I as well. So call the vote. Okay. So. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Thank you. And with that, we can adjourn. All right. Thank you. Good job.